All right. Good evening. Welcome to the deep diving class this evening. Uh, one of my uh, favorite courses to teach. It, we get because we get to go diving deep. Um, so definitely a fun course to teach. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see window. There we go. So you should be able to see my screen here in a second here. All right. Deep diving. Um, I'll be your instructor today. Assist, um, I'm an assistant instructor creator with SSI and Idaho Dive Pirates. Um, and we're talking about deep diving. My name is Benjamin Hadfield. Um, uh, just to give you an idea of some of the things as you guys are kind of moving through your diving journey, there's a lot of different places to go with that. So um, and as you guys will see throughout this presentation, I like to use photos um, that are actually real with myself or my wife or my family or friends in it, uh, people that I know. So um, as we go through this, just be aware that those are all available to look at. Um, Josh, I know you'll be with me on Thursday as well. We'll be doing uh, um, altitude diving on Thursday. James, you're welcome to join in on that. Just need to sign up at the shop. And then tomorrow night is night four of open water. James, if you're going to uh, be one of our dive cut candidates, you are more than welcome to participate in it. And that's what we do is we invite you out to open water trainings we're doing. Um, and any class that I've taught uh, before, you're welcome to um, audit again and uh, come out with the dives provided I have room. Just let me know that you want to come out so that I can make sure I, I'm able to accommodate you. That's, that's the only thing I ask. So, um, And as you guys go through these and take your uh, courses with me and you go out doing your real diving, um, please make sure to send me pictures. I like to see what you guys are doing, what you guys are up to, and you know, live semi-vicariously through you. Um, as we go through this process this evening, I'm going to be using the SSI Diver Diamond. Uh, it starts off with, I'm going to help build some knowledge. We're going to work on some skills. We're going to talk about the equipment. And I'm going to give you experience, um, both in the diving and hopefully a good experience to do this as well. So that's my two-time experience of the process. Our training works off with, uh, we'll do, we'll start our training. We'll do some water sessions, develop ability, learn some skills. We'll increase some confidence, evoke some conditional response, and help you become a safe diver. My expect expectations for you guys, the course standards are, um, to log in and do your homework, participate in the class, do academics, all the academic sessions, um, if you wouldn't mind. And uh, we will be doing three open water dives on this as well. Um, we will be, um, since I taught this last, there has been a standard change, standards change. So they are uh, a little different, um, 60, 80, and 100. There we go. Perfect. So that is the uh, something I hadn't caught yet, but the standard change, we do dive a reverse profile. Please, in your own diving, please do not dive a reverse profile. We, um, I'm a highly trained individual, and uh, I will make sure I keep you safe, um, and we'll make sure to do this very carefully. But we will be diving 60, 80, and 100, but we'll be making sure to stay within 20 feet of the previous dive. Uh, there will be exam at the end of this. Uh, the final exam, you have to give me an 80% or better. Shouldn't be too terribly difficult. They must have fun as well. If you're not having fun, please say something because diving should be fun. This is not a, a, a stick in the mud sport, right? We're out having fun. Um, as we go through this process, please be aware. Um, I live and dive by refuse. If you wouldn't mind, go to Idaho Dive Pirates and to Teach Me to Dive. If you think I'm a great instructor, say that. If you think I suck as an instructor, say that. All I can ever ask from you is integrity. So please be honest in whatever you do, but please do give me a review because we do really do live and die by those reviews. And uh, um, we did definitely work hard to make sure um, we go through that. So guys, what is your expectation from this class? Yeah, I mean, to learn to deep dive safely. There we go. J James, what is your expectation? So I think for me, it's really more of an entryway into more of the technical diving aspect. I've been looking a lot more at, you know, side mountain overhead environments as well as, you know, the extended range uh, side of things. So I think it's more of just an entry into that. Awesome. Well, good. Well, the good news is I'm certified to teach all the way through extended range. And uh, if we could do Trimix out here, I, could, I would do that, but we cannot, so I don't. Um, but I'm also a uh, fully uh, operational and uh, a competent side mount diver and instructor all the way through XR in side mount as well. So Josh is getting ready to take my side mount course. You're welcome to take side mount with me. I'd certainly love that. I've got a, a lot of experience. I've been doing it for about uh, six or seven years now um, and been through a lot of different rigs. So definitely have a um, experience of what not to do and what to do as well and and had some very successful uh, side mount students come out from under me. So happy to be a part of the course. Taking. Say again? When's that course at? 
Um, we do it here. Uh, we we start off with a couple hours in the pool, um, and then we start uh, we start up with you doing. We sign you up for recreational side mount, um, and get you comfortable in side mount. And the key with it is it's a new configuration. It's different. Um, uh, the shop I encourage people to do the K2. It's um, honestly the K2 in side mount is almost like cheating in side mount. It's it's the probably the the simplest and sturdiest rig that I've uh, I have personally dove. And I've dove a bunch of different rigs. Um, so we get you into a fitting um, with the K2, and, and that takes about an hour or so. And then um, I like to pull you to the pool, um, and that takes an hour or two to get your basic idea. We come back into the classroom, and we start dialing it out, and then we see where you're at on that. And if I feel comfortable after two hours, we can start into open water. If I don't, then we do another pool session to make sure that you are comfortable. And then we go out to Ryrie, and uh, we do our di- our basic dives out there, and then I – uh, my encouragement is to turn you loose. I'd like to see you have at least 20 to 40 side mount dives before I take you into XR in the side mount configuration, because we're definitely moving into a, a more complex environment. But I can get you certified up that so you're comfortable, ready to go and and off to do your thing. And then uh, once you feel comfortable and you're ready to move up to that next level, the next step is uh, we take the XR course uh, or I'm sorry, the deco procedures course. Um, as I were, um, and uh, with deco procedures, we start introducing you into the the world of decompre- limited decompression, um, as well as utilizing um, a decompression gas uh, up to forty percent, and understanding what that what that entails, what that means, um, how does that affect you. So we go through all that process and introduce you in that, and then as we get move uh, more comfortable into that process, the next step after that is either advanced nitrox um, or extended range. Um, it just depends on where you're at when I when I finish up with uh, deco procedures, um, and uh, we go from there. And so, when we finish up to extended range, um, that'll take you to 45 meters um, with up to an hour of deco. Um, so, you, and you'll be able to carry uh, up to six tanks. Um, we don't generally get the get to that point because that's a lot of freaking tanks to carry. But um, you'll be comfortable carrying at least three to four. Um, very, and you'll, uh, we can get practice with that. So that's kind of the process. It's not rocket science, to be honest with you. It's with extended range. The biggest concern and the biggest thing is comfort in position. And I just cannot stress that highly enough. In any time you're starting to get into more advanced diving, the biggest, biggest, biggest skill to learn is comfort in position. And what I mean by that is a typical uh, dive plan in technical diving is I'll go out and I'll do a 175 foot dive, for example, right? And I'm out, I'm out there for an hour which means my first deco stop will probably be four to five minutes at 90 feet, uh, four to five minutes at 80 feet, four to five minutes at six, 70 feet, or I'm sorry, 70 feet, uh, three or four or five minutes at um, 60 feet, 40 feet. I'll, I'll probably do my, my longest one or not longest, but the longest one. So to that point, and that'll be maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then my longest one will probably be uh, 30 minutes at 20 feet. Right. And so the thing about it is, is, you know, think about it like this, turn the TV off in your living room, uh, turn off all the lights and land your coffee table in exact position with with uh, tanks on your side, um, and try and do that for 20 minutes. Um, it's harder to do that in open water uh, because you can't be kicking around, you can't be um, moving around and and uh, doing things. You've got to be able to relax. And your overall goal with with that is you almost want to. I'm just so you can see me. You almost want to get to the point where you fall asleep. You get in that position. General fin kicks once in a while, but just to kind of keep position and and really just kind of keep your foot from falling asleep. But the goal is, is you get to that point where you fall, almost want to fall asleep in position. You're just kind of watching the time, relaxing. Um, you know, I have, you know, you have those big mental games of, should I get a puppy? Did I leave the stove on? You know, things like that. Uh, you know, and you, you get a lot of time with yourself. So the secret, the other secret with deco diving is you have to like yourself because you're going to get in position in deco diving at some point where you're sitting there for a period of time where there's really nothing to look at, but ocean. And uh, so you have the opportunity to, to think <laughs> a lot. So, but again, the biggest skill is getting in that comfort level where you're comfortable in position, comfortable in gear and able to, to manipulate the gear comfortably, but um, it takes practice. It's not something that comes overnight. Um, and uh, so that's why I say we get you through side mount. It takes uh, two open water dives um, and uh, at least one pool session to certify you in recreational side mount. And that'll, that'll take you up to two tanks. 
Um, and then, like I said, I want to see you out there dive 10, 15, 20 more dives to get comfortable. And then I bring you back to the pool. We do an evaluation of skills to see where you're at before we bring you to deco procedures so I can feel comfortable um, taking you to the next level to see, do you just need more time um, or do we need, uh, uh, or, we're, or are we ready to move on? You know, how have you adjusted to those, to that equipment configuration? It's like trying, if you've never driven a standard transmission, it's, it's like trying to get um, to the point where you're comfortable driving a standard transmission in New York City at rush hour. So what do you do in that initial side mount class? We do it right here at the shop. I do it live. Um, we uh, we uh, get your D your uh, BCN. Um, like I said, my encouragement is, is the K2, but um, I've got experience with the X Deep um, as well, so that's not a big deal. Um, I haven't tried the new um, Dive Right Ray yet, but it's just like the K2. It's very much like the K2. My suggestion is the uh, is the K2. It's it's the I, in my opinion, it's the best one on the market. I've I've tried the X Deep. I've tried the Razor. I've tried the SMS uh, 75 and the SMS 100, um, and uh, I've I, a few other dive right uh, specialties um, that I've had to kind of pull around and rip apart and take apart and put back together the right way. Um, the K2 is, you know, why go second rate? It's just it's like cheating. Uh, but we'll take you an hour worth of setup and dial in and get the idea of here's where your stuff's at, and then we grab some tanks and I keep a couple of. Uh, sets of aluminum 80s in side mount configuration at the shop, ready to go for teaching. We go in the pool, which I like to spend at least an hour, uh, two hours is better, just getting you to the point of comfort and, and relaxing and make sure you're trimmed and make sure you understand how to take it apart, put it back together and how to lay in it and how to how to make the key adjustments. So there's so a lot that, of- Essentially, once that rig just comes in, then we just go to settle it up. Yep. Okay. So like, did you order a K2 and uh, some regs? No, I haven't. I haven't looked at it yet. Okay, cool. There should be an extra pair of um, Hollis 200 LXs coming in. Um, one of my students ordered them. Um, there was a problem with the the batch of regs that came out uh, uh, in May, and so there should be an extra pair of 200 LXs with DCX DS DCX uh, first stages that are perfect for a side mount coming in. Um, I'm hoping any time because I've got. A, <laughs> I have a reg in there too. So, um, but that's what I use. I either use the XTX 50, which is apex or the uh, Hollis 200 LX. I like the Hollis 200 LX a lot better. Um, that's what Josh, uh, has on his, as his primary reg for his uh, back mount is a, um, Hollis 200 LX. It's nice reg, really nice. Yeah. So, but yeah, just get the gear. The, um, you do get, if you're, if you sign up for the side mount course first and then order the gear, you get 20% off the gear. So, Kind of a pro tip for you, and the course is like two fifty. So, there you go. That's your, uh, that's the path that to XR. Um, to get into XR. I, I don't know where you're at in dives there, uh, James, but I, I need to look that up. But I believe that um, the entry level requirement for XR is seventy five dives. If I remember correctly, I'll need to look that up. I just can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but I can certainly give me a second. I can I'll, I'll pull that up. So there's definitely an entry point to number of dives. Let's see. Da, da, da. Training standards, extended range. Here we go. Give me a second. I'll pull it up right now just to make sure I'm talking out the correct side of my face here. Let's see. XR programs. Uh, uh, extended range overhead. Extended range SCR. Oh, there it is. Extended range. Here we go. Pull it. This computer's running slow. Da, da, da. Okay, to a maximum depth. total dives. Let's see, 50 dives. There it is. And you have to have this course and nitrox. So you already have nitrox. You have to have this course to enter into it. Um, so you have to have a, fifth, a minimum of uh, 50 dives. Um, I do know that they're talking about adding an hour requirement, uh, an hourly requirement for it as well. Right now it says have at least 50 dives, but uh, I, I do. I'm in kind of the disc. Um, the circle where they talk about what they're changing that to, and they're talking about adding um, a 40 hour minimum on that as well. So, which I highly encourage. I think that's a very good idea, but that's neither here nor there. It's not there right now. So 50 dives is your minimum. Where are you at in jives, James? Uh, just about 30. Okay, perfect. So that, um, so you're almost, you're almost there ready for that. But uh, with side mount, you can do side mount uh, recreational right out of open water. So, um, we could get you to side mount here pretty quick and, and, uh, 
start moving the rest of your dives into side mount so you can start building up that configuration comfort. It is a, it's a very different setup. Um, once you get into it, uh, it's very rare for me to have somebody say, after they get into side mount, say, gosh, this sucks. I hate it. Um, I'll rather dive by back mount. I, I honestly can't tell you anybody that I, I talk to that would rather dive back mount um, than side mount. So it's very comfortable. Um, and uh, it's just, like I said, it's just the difference between a manual and an automatic transmission. It's just very, it's just a different configuration and kind of the key is understanding it. So happy to help you with that. Yes, and redundancy tanks as well is always nice. Oh, it's amazing. It absolutely for redundancy. It's, I had a dive and we were, Nikki and I were diving a shore dive in Hawaii uh, not long ago. And, and uh, I had a pretty good bubbler off of, uh, uh, off an O-ring on one of my, on my right tank. And I just didn't want to end the dive. I just didn't really feel like it's so what I did is I just reached over and I turned the tank off. Just didn't even worry about it. It's like, you know what, whatever. I'll, um, when I get ready, I'll, I'll flip back over to that tank and I'll breathe that one down. And we're just doing a shore dive so I can get back to shore pretty easily. And so I dove for about an hour, 10 minutes on the, on my left tank only. And then, uh, got to, uh, got to about a uh, thousand PSI on my left tank and I was starting to get a little off balance. So I just flipped over and flipped on my right tank and got about an hour on the, the right tank. So we were two hours and 20 minutes, but it wasn't bubbling as much as I thought it was, but it was still bubbling. And it was like, well, why? Not a big deal. I'll just shh, continue my dive. So it's nice. I, I like it. If you have a, if you have an emergency, you're a lot more prepared, but that's I, in my mind in side mount, that's really secondary. I hate to say that. I, I love the redundancy. I love the additional safety, but for me, it's the comfort. It, it's, it is really easy to do a three hour dive in a side mount setup um, versus twin sets or back mount. I, I detest diving back mount. I detest diving twin sets. I teach them, I dive them. Um, but when you guys see me out doing my own dives, unless it's cold water and I'm having to wear an FFM, um, you'll see, you'll nine after that time, you'll see me in, in side mount because it's so much more comfortable. It's just, a much more comfortable dive. So for me, it's about the comfort of it. Um, it's easier. It's just, I can lay there forever and just, and not worry about it. I don't feel pressure on my back at all. Um, I don't get as tired. I go through about 30% less air because of it, um, because it's less effort to, to move through the water. Nothing's wider than your shoulders. So for every one kick I do, you'll have to do two kicks to do, to create the same propulsion because I'm that much more streamlined. So you'll go through less gas. Um, in twin set back mount, um, I'm about nine, 10 liters a minute, um, typically. Um, in side mount, I'm more like seven um, liters a minute, which is a very, very low, uh, very, very low uh, um, dynamic. So uh, oh, let's see. Give me one second. Let's see. None of the links uh, working for the call for the call in meeting online. Okay. Oh, it's Ryan Bester. Let me just uh, send him a fresh link. Uh, try that. And we've got two other of uh, my dive masters that would like to join us tonight. Uh, all right. Let's see if I can spell the name. We're doing really good. Brian Bester, there we go, B, B, and it's good. Uh, there we go. There we go. Perfect. All right. So that's my my pitch on on uh, side mount. I'm I'm a huge side mount diver. I, it's it's my absolute preference to dive side mount. I feel it's a ton more comfortable um, and uh, a substantial amount more enjoyable. So. Um, that's my, uh, I think on it. So you're welcome to, um, start the course anytime we, uh, we do it generally in the evenings. Um, it's kind of the best time to do it. Um, like I said, plan on three hours at the shop for class one. Um, most likely it'll be four to be truthful with you. So just how it ends up being, but it's fun. That's for sure. So I'm trying to convince Ryan to come over to side mount with me over the dark side. It, the thing about side mount is it used to be very uh, fringe diving. Um, and there's still a lot of people out there that are like, oh, side mount. And they've got this, oh, uh, and I'm like, 
and my usually my answer typically and my buddies is usually shut the hell up until you try it. Uh, if you try it, give it an honest chance and still hate it, then absolutely talk all you want. Um, talk all the smack you want. But until you try side mount, give it a fair chance. Um, don't I, I prefer people, you know, don't get the uh, and and you get that a lot in Florida, especially southern Florida, where they do a lot of boat diving. They're like, oh, my God, it's a side mount guy. Oh, you know, it's. I've got a deal on the boat that if anybody on the boat can get in the water faster than me, I, I'll buy lunch. Flat out. Um, there's nobody that can beat me getting ready inside uh, in back mount when I'm in side mount. I'll be in the water before him and I'll be the last one out of the water and I'll be the most comfortable with, and I'll have used the least amount of air. So that's my pitch. Happy to help when you get, get to that point. You're welcome to come tomorrow night as well to open water. So let's go ahead and jump into this and I'm going to add this back over. I think um, Brian is having some technical difficulties. So we got through that. Um, what's your expectation from me today? What can I do to make sure that I give you guys a fantastic and amazing experience? Do you guys freeze? Josh? No, we're here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, my expectation for you is just to, I mean, I guess be you and teach, do, do well at teaching the class and uh, get us engaged and enjoying the, the learning process. Awesome. James, what can I do to give you an outstanding class today? Well, I think the same thing is, you know, just answer the questions as honest as you can and give an unbiased opinion on uh, any topics that are brought up. Absolutely. I will always give you the honest opinion based upon my actual experience. I, I just don't have the time to try and guess at this crap. Um, and I've done it enough at this point that um, I've got a lot of experience. So um, happy to happy to help and definitely up the chain when it comes to um, the uh, the diving experience. I'm the only technical diving instructor within about 400 miles, um, that, as well as uh, um, I'm an assistant instructor trainer. So I'm one of the highest one of the three highest guys in the area. So Brett and I are the same level um, in terms of open water. So there we go. And I, and I guarantee I've got the most experience of technical diving anywhere, in way around. So we're going to go through a few things tonight. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the exposure system. We're going to talk about the delivery system, information, buoyancy, and accessories. Remember it's all about the accessories. It's not about the diving. So uh, special equipment. One of the things you got to be, you got to be aware of. And when you start diving into the great unknown in the deep is it will get dark. But there's another consideration as well. Josh, why is it important for me to have a dive light when I'm diving to 100 feet, for example? Well, I mean, just out at Mariri, it gets dark at about 35, 40 feet. Sure. Other than the dark, though, there's another big reason why I always want to carry a light. Other than the dark? Other than the dark. I mean, to, you can restore colors at depth. Exactly. So we know that about 15 feet, are, we start losing reds. Um, um, about 25 feet or so, we start losing oranges till eventually we get down to this magical mystery land of the net, like this photo right here. Um, that one's at 125 feet, no light on us, everything. And you get this beautiful monochrome set of blues. There's just no color, right? It just, it's not exciting. So as we go through this portion, this process, remember that, um, you will be getting and losing light and you can see kind of how dark this is. This is out in the Caribbean um, on the, my, one of my favorite wrecks. I love the lady luck is she's just a fun wreck to dive, but uh, you'll definitely lose color. Um, so, um, but you'll also get darker as well as seeing through things. There's also cool things out there as well. As we start getting into the deep, you'll start getting into some other wrecks and you, and while I'm going to discourage you guys from doing any penetration until you are properly trained, trained for that, um, light penetration in terms of going to a hole or into a light hallway is definitely a lot of fun and there's interesting things to see. So just be aware of that as well. Other special equipment, uh, definitely to your advantage. Uh, make sure you have your dive tables and understand, you know, what you're doing as well as a good computer. But a slate, a slate is huge. Having a way to communicate or write things down um, is to your advantage. Um, a couple other things you can do with a slate as well is you can write a health message on it and send it up on your SMB. So if there's a problem as well. So you can communicate with yourself. You can communicate with the surface. You can communicate with your buddies around. If you dive with me and you uh, see something interesting, we're, go out, we're going to go out to Ryrie and we're at 100 feet and you say, you point over to me and say, Benjamin, you know, and we're using hand and iron arm signals on this, of course. 
You look over at me and say, Benjamin, there's a you know, fish. What is it? I will write on my dive site. Fish. If I'm feeling particularly adventurous that day, I might say yellow fish. So I'll communicate and I'll happily, happily share what kind of, um, the, uh, I, I definitely see your fish as well. But definitely handy to have. The other thing I like having a slate for as well is I always, always write out my dive plan. Um, I think it's important. Um, I make sure to put together a basic dive plan of what I expect. Um, you guys see, we'll see this when we do our class together. I'll write out the skills we're going to accomplish. And I'll also write out the dive plan that we will be doing our 60, 80 and a hundred foot dive. Again, disclaimer, please don't do reverse profiles other than if you're with me. Um, there's a specific reason we're doing them in this order. Um, it is to the standards and it's been cleared by dam.org. So that's my disclaimer for the day. Other key things, diver tool. What kind of diver tool, James, do you think are going to be important as you're doing some of these uh, deep dives? Um, a tank light. Tank lights are cool. Um, I'm not a huge fan of tank lights it, um, unless I'm with students. I like uh, they're nice on my students because they flash, flash, flash. But, um, you know, certainly other people have different opinions on them. That's just my personal. I, uh, yes and no. How about that? What, but there's other types of dive tools. If I were to go to uh, your car, what kind of tools might I find in your in your car? Would I find a knife? Um, yeah, I've got a couple of them. Absolutely. So you're definitely, you know, a knife, some way to cut free of something, right? So little dive tools like that. And then uh, as we're going out to the site, because what you'll find is most places we're going to go, we're going to do deep diving, are ten, tend to be within two minutes or five minutes of a, an Ace Hardware. So a, a spare parts kit, a repair kit, so a screwdriver, a wrench. Um, I like a pair of channel locking, uh, um, uh, channel locking wrench. Um, that has been the probably the handiest stupid thing in my toolkit that I have. I got it over Harbor Freight for like eight bucks. Um, couple of different sizes of screwdrivers. Um, oh, how about O-rings? You guys think uh, a little pack of O-rings might be decent? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I pay about 10 bucks for one of those little, it looks like a little tank, blue tank or yellow tank um, and of O-rings. They're about 10 bucks and I think you get about 30 in them. So definitely a value having a little thing of O-rings because I, can, I can't tell you honestly how many O-rings I've, I've had to replace over the course of my diving career, but it's been a good number. Um, it's definitely not been a small number. So I've, I have refilled my little blue um, container of O-rings at least four or five times that I can recall just off the top of my head. So it definitely happens. Um, and it's definitely how ticked off James would you be if you'd flown to truck lagoon, you're out 25 miles off the shore and you blow an O-ring and you, you forgot to bring a 25 cent O-ring with you. You probably end up paying about 20 bucks for one. Most likely. Hey, I'll buy your O-ring from you, right? Yep. <laughs> Whatever it takes. So, hey. yes, sir. Dalton's had a dove there before. Say again? Dalton has dove there before. Oh, that's awesome. Well, Dalton's a super, super amazing woman anyway. So she's far better than you deserve, to be honest with you. Oh, thank you. She's sitting here right next to me, and she just said that. And she heard you talk about that class. Oh. David. Oh, good. Dalton, he doesn't deserve you, but so he hopefully he treats you good. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, you know, you, as we go through this process, making sure you have diver's tools, a, a, a dive knife, a, you know, basic ideas, a slate, um, a light is definitely going to be to your advantage and making sure you're geared correctly. You know, it's, it's kind of the Boy Scout law, if you will. We want to make sure we have all the stuff to be prepared, right? Hopefully, you don't ever have to use a knife, but I, I would be willing to bet at some point you're going to have to use a knife. <clears throat> I'm just giving an idea. This is one of my one of my dive computers. Um, I keep a knife. Uh, I do a it's a caver trick, but I keep a a, a little uh, dive knife right on my knife or right on my dive computer on my wrist. Um, it's always ready to go. It's easy to get to, and I've had. Uh, multiple cases where I needed to get to a knife extremely fast and it was right there on my wrist and it was handy to go. So little things go a long way when it comes to diving. And, and I want to say one of these stupid little frog knives, um, these Aqualung frog knives, I think they're about 40 bucks. And uh, this particular frog knife, I, well, I wouldn't go as far to say as it saved my life. Um, it has prevented, it prevented two accidents that could have been, that could have gone pretty bad. Um, so that's what, that's why I'll leave that at. 
And then I, I carry a spare parts kit. Um, you can get them anywhere. I, I get mine from Amazon, to be honest, here for about a, uh, 150 bucks. So um, good things to have for sure. Let's see. I think we get that. The other thing to be aware of as we kind of go through this, um, be aware all of a sudden you guys are going to start doing the, the deep dive, right? So you want to make sure you service your equipment on a regular basis. Um, the thing I have discovered about pressure is it will reveal a lot of a lot more weaknesses in your equipment than you will ever find at 30 feet. So the deeper you go, the more likely, um, I like to call it the uh, gremlins of the deep, but gremlins of the deep definitely come out. So the more we can take a little bit of time and protect our system by making sure we do a delivery system uh, check on it, make sure we're take, taking our regulator in on a regular basis or before any big trip, is it, hey, Brett, let's check the intermediate pressure. Are the uh, the seals good? Um, is there any um, any valves that need to be replaced? Is there something that needs to happen? Is, is the diaphragm need to be checked? Is it, you know, whatever's going on. So make sure we're, we're using the proper equipment and that it's checked regularly. One of the things I think that a lot of people miss, honestly, is little things like the information system. Um, I have a habit that before every uh, time I go on a, uh, a dive trip, before I leave home, I pull the battery out of my computer. I don't care how good it is. I take it out. I throw it away and I put a brand new fresh battery in it. And I throw four or five uh, brand new batteries that I bought from the store um, in my uh, Save a Dive kit. So I've always got a fresh battery before any trip. It's little dumb things like that. Um, I also go through and I, I take the auto, uh, APVs, automatic pressurization valves, uh, or, or OPVs, uh, overpressurization valves, off my BC. I run them under clean and clear water, and I make sure that the, the seal is good, that it's, and it's nice and rubber soft seal. Um, I make sure the springs aren't rusted or gooby. Um, I make sure that they're, they're clean and free, and I also make sure that there's nothing in inside my BC because – I mean, who wants to travel with a quart of water in your BC anyway? But I make sure it's clean and dry and that there's no tears in my BC. So I do a full visual inspection of my, my BC uh, to make sure everything's good. I make sure the straps are in good condition. There's no tears or rips. But I do a visual inspection of that. And like I said, I take anything that can come off. I rinse it and visually inspect to make sure it's in good condition. It's just a little thing to do. It's um, It takes me about a half hour to, between the batteries and taking it apart, cleaning it, make sure my seals are good. But it's worth it. It's worth it. And then, like I said, drop your uh, regular set off at the dive shop and make sure that they are uh, good to go as well. So little things like that. Um, and again, like I said, the uh, the gremlins of the deep are uh, amazing. The deeper you go, the more gremlins you will find. Um, and it's interesting how that happens. I, I The only time I've ever gotten a knot in my, uh, my finger spool is at 150 feet. I have never had a knot in my finger spool at 30 feet, 50 feet, 70 feet, 100 feet. The only time I've, and it's happened to me twice at 150 feet where I've gotten a knot in my stinking reel spool, right? Not my reel, but my spool, my finger spool. So it's amazing that the only place this has ever happened is at 150 feet. So you judge for I, that. And I have a hard time blaming that one on pressure. I blame that purely on the, uh, the depth. So. Um, does that make sense, guys? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Roger that. Okay, good. So as we start getting into deep diving, we want to make sure we we take a little bit of time to repair. So the main way we can avoid accidents, guys, is plan our dives and dive our plans. It's just that easy. Now, Ryan, you've been deep diving with me and you took my deep dive course. What's one of the things we do before we start going out and do a deep dive? Um, we make sure... Uh, kind of broke up on me try that one more time ask your question one more time again no worries so you uh last summer when we were going out and doing our deep dives together what's what what is something we did before we did our deep dives together Uh, we make sure we had all of our equipment ready to go. We uh, make sure that each one of us were comfortable doing a deep dive, and we kind of mapped out what we we're going to do, how deep we we're going to go, and then how long we we're going to stay down there. So basically our bottom Absolutely. time, and then mm -hmm. where we're going to come up, and if we're going to have different profiles coming up. So kind of went over that dive plan. So Absolutely. Uh, we mapped out our gas requirements as well, didn't we? 
Yeah, that too. Yep. How much gas we have with that gas. Absolutely. So we took some time and that's one of the big things um, that I can tell you with any, any type of diving you should do. But the nice thing is if you're going out and doing, uh, you know, 30, 60 foot shallow reefs, it doesn't require as much planning. I mean, you, if you're, um, if you're talking about hiking and you're going to hike through um, Cape Curly Park or our uh, Toffus Park, not a lot of merge situations going to happen that you can't handle in Toffus Park, but that becomes very different if you're going to hike to the top of Mount Bora, right? Um, you, there's definitely, if you try to uh, prepare for a Toffus Park, but you do Mount Bora, it's going to be very different. If something happens at the top of Mount Bora, bigger problems happen. So we want to make sure we talk about this ahead of time. We start taking into considerations things like support personnel. If, if something happens, who's there to support us? How are we going to support that? Simple enough. Um, how, what happens in emergency? Um, where, where that, where's that going to come from? The next piece is, is as we start getting ready to go deep, we're going much deeper than you guys are accustomed to. How are we going to get there? Now, my personal favorite way to do this is to typically go down a da- use a downline. I like going to the end of the dock, swim over to the downline, and you're just going straight down the downline. But not everybody's comfortable with using a descent or um, an ascent line. As, uh, and uh, they don't have that opportunity um, sometimes as well. It's my favorite way to do that. And if you do Rex in Florida, that's a lot of time. The only way to do it is uh, to go down the buoy line. So you need to be plan on that. The nice thing with Ryrie is that you could also do a very easy sh- um, the shore. You just take the shoreline down and follow it out. But you need to, you know, kind of prep that uh, that dynamic as well. So guys, there's there's uh, th- we'll just say there's three of us: Josh, James, and, uh, and me. Um, where should I, we place the most experienced diver. There were three of us going down a line. Where do we place the most experienced diver? Back. I'm sorry, say again? In the back. At the top, at the line? Okay, that's yep. one answer. Josh, where should we place the most experienced diver? Yeah, I mean, I think they both have pros and cons, but probably, probably the back, so they can actually see what's going on. At the top of the line? So put we send our... Least experienced diver down the line first. Right? Where do you think? Where do we, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I mean, you've got observation of everything. You can easily descend faster if you need to in order to catch up. You can still gain communication. If you're going down first, it's harder to look up than it is to look down. Okay. Ryan, where do you think? What did, What's your thought process on that? I would say first only only because when we were in Portugal, um, the most experienced guy went first and he just made sure that we were following behind him. And if he needed to tell us anything, he would turn around, tell us some signals. It's easier to turn around and get a whole focus on the whole group instead of trying to catch up to somebody and pull their fin. So I would say first, it's easier to turn around than it is to catch up to somebody. Sure. So as we're going down the descent line, generally we want to put, if it's the three of us, we're going to put the most ex- experienced person in the middle so he can touch both of the other two divers um, or second in line. So we put one um, one, one reasonably experienced diver uh, below him and then the rest of the divers above him. But you want to try and put the most experienced diver somewhere closer to the middle or to the front, but not in the front, but not all the way behind as well. Um, that gives them the greatest amount of control of the group and they're able to touch as many people as humanly possible. And there's times where the, you can go down a descent line where you're not, you don't have to touch the line. Um, but for example, if you're diving the HMS or the uh, Rinsky or uh, uh, you know, something with a good current, uh, typically you're going to have to be on the line. Uh, uh, like when we did the HMS or we do the uh, um, printing press, uh, which is hole in the wall, um, the, there's enough current that once we get up to that 90 foot, 80 feet, 70 feet, 60 feet, uh, 20, all the way up to 20 feet, sometimes you feel a bit like a flag. You're holding on for dear life and you feel a bit like a flag. And the trick is, is to, to find that place where you can kind of chill out. But there's times where you just don't have that. So typically, as you guys look at that, we were gonna try, we're going to try and put the most experienced diver to the middle or slightly to the front, depending upon how many divers we go down with. So uh, as we look at that, because you want the most experienced diver to be able to grab hold of as many people as at the same time as possible. So as we start looking at that, we want to kind of get an idea where we want to put our key people and, and our non-key people, right? Uh, other things that we can certainly do if we're doing a descent line 
is we can uh, plan our safety stops and we can actually add a safety cylinder on the line. And it's a very nice thing to do. If something happens, you're low on gas, but you still need uh, time on your safety stop to have a, a, a cylinder on that, on a, on a safety stop line. So things to be aware of um, is, do we have the ability to do that? Should we do that? Um, as we're going down the line, where are we going to put our service marker so that um, people aren't going to run us over? Now, there's a difference between deep diving and, di and, and uh, diving um, in lakes and the ocean. Huge difference. One of the things I can tell you from personal experience when we start diving like Ryrie is it's, it's fairly unusual for me to use a dive flag in somewhere um, like Yellowstone Lake or Ryrie or Redfish Lake. Um, those are the three main lakes I dive. Um, I've never used one in the river uh, because it just float away. Um, but, and the reason being is the problem with diving inland is that we have a lot of people with not nearly enough experience of understanding what a red and white flag looks like. Well, they get curious. And in my opinion, I feel that a dive flag become creates a safety uh, safety risk for my divers because it, it, it draws the boats over to them instead of repelling them away. Now, in the ocean, a dive flag is a whole different thing, and, and people understand that they have to stay at least 300 feet away. Um, that's And by the way, that's the state law for Idaho, and, the, and it's the uh, Coast Guard law as well, that if you see a, an alpha flag or a, or a dive flag, um, that you have to stay 300 feet away um, because you're endangering the divers. But you definitely want to make sure that we understand what is uh, what does a surface marker look like as we start doing this. Um, what is what's one of the uh, the biggest dangers, um, Josh? If we're doing a deep dive, I mean, um, what's probably one of the bigger dangers that we might face as a deep diver? Um, I mean, nitrogen narcosis. Nitrogen narcosis, absolutely. What's the other one? There's two of them that we need to worry about. Uh, DCS. DCS, absolutely. So DCS is the more prevalent that, um, that uh, I have concern and top of mind, but I would argue that nitronarcosis is more dangerous. So uh, because we're more likely to find it and more likely to happen to us, the one that comes top of mind, we, we, uh, we worry about DCS. So the other thing we need to worry about is if we want to treat either one of those, what, James, what's the treatment for either one of those? Right from the dive book. Um, oxygen. Oxygen, absolutely. So as we go and start doing these deep dives, we want to make sure we know where there's oxygen to get to, right? Now, the good news is when you guys dive with me, as the instructor, I, I have two bottles of oxygen in my truck at all times. They're right now. Walk out there and grab them. And I've got it. So I have enough oxygen for two people for up to an hour, which is about enough to get, get you anywhere we need to go. So I can, I can treat two divers simultaneously or one diver for two hours. So... But we want to know, where is that auction at? So, Josh, if we're coming up ashore, um, what are some, some of the problems that could happen coming up a shoreline? Uh, coming up a shoreline? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's you're going to be following a shallow. I mean, you're going to be sh not shallow, but you're going to be close to the bottom the whole time. So... I guess stirring up the bottom and decreasing the probability of getting medically. something. How about medically, though? What are some of the problems that could happen coming up a shoreline? Um, I mean, you could think it's less steep than it is and come up too fast. You could. That's certainly something. It's not a typical, but how about sharp rocks or sharp, sharp objects or, or uh, things that'll sting you, bite you, um, cut you? Sure. Absolutely. Um, it's more common than most people realize. Or how about a wave, a random wave? You ever, uh, anybody in the ocean and um, go out uh, body surfing or goofing around in the, in the waves and, and get hit by a random wave that you didn't expect? Am I the only one? James, how about you? You ever been hit by just a random wave just out of the blue? Well, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of scary, isn't it? What if there have been sharp rocks or... Um, uh, or sea urchins there. I mean, that could have been a, not a good situation, right? Been there too. Absolutely. I was talking to a friend of mine. Uh, he was talking, he was uh, coming up um, and they'd gotten to a four foot area in Hawaii as they were coming um, on the shoreline. 
and all of a sudden the waves came back and then pushed him all of a sudden and it dropped him into a blowhole that he was. And because of where the, the waves were starting, uh, coming, um, it was coming, they were going out too fast and coming in too fast for him to be able to get out of the blowhole. So he got stuck in the blowhole um, that was about 75 feet deep through the blowhole and couldn't get out. There was no exit. Didn't see it. It was just, you know, it was just, just another dark spot in the rocks that happened to be about three or four feet wide, but things happen. And, and he said he got pretty bruised up, got pretty cut up as he, as he fell into that. So definitely as we're coming up the shoreline or coming up, there are definitely things that'll stick us. Uh, Nikki, uh, I forgot her boots. It was completely my fault. She decided to dive her boot fins with flip-flops instead. And, and as we were walking back to shore, the flip-flop bent, stepped right on a sea urchin. So something poked her, right? Got a Hawaiian tattoo. So as we as we do this, we're going to be in situations where we're going to be away from medical providers. So a good first aid kit, definitely to your advantage. And, and it's one of the things that I definitely encourage that as you guys travel, get you one of those little scout, uh, um, nice little um, scout uh, first aid kits. They're, you can get them. They're about this big. Got some bandages in it, some Neosporin, maybe some sunblock. Make some good, if you get sunblock in there, get reef safe sunblock, please. There's your safe environmental diving message, but um, get a few things in there. Maybe some tweezers. Tweezers, I tell you what, go a long freaking way. You'll use them on your tanks. You use them on the splinters. So a little, a few basic ideas like items like that. Um, it, it'll take up all of about a pound of your of weight. Have a little first aid kit in there because I have I have read more incident reports where I just read one the other day from six months ago uh, where they um, had two divers present with DCS. They went to open get the O bottle off the boat and the uh, nobody had the key to the lock and the key, the lock was rusted shut. So while we would like to believe that all these dive boats are fantastic and really prepared, they've got their O kit, their first aid kit and everything's really easy accessible. Who's on uh, Ryan, who's responsible for your dive? Sorry, I got a little water in my speaker. Say that one more time. Who is responsible for your dive? We are responsible for our dive. Absolutely. Um, I can't trust, and I won't trust, um, that somebody else has got my back. Our, uh, James, you were in the Army. You've seen that once or twice. You, you ever have a buddy that uh, shorted the supplies in the field? Well, we usually have pretty good layouts in Ranger Bat, but, yeah, I've seen a few guys that uh, might have skimped on a few things. Yeah, spare socks or something. It happens, right? You, you you think you got a good buddy that has all the crap and, and is dialed in the way he should be, but forget something stupid as a pair of socks. You're like, come on, guy, right? You're all soaked. You, I, we're in Georgia, man. What did you think was going to happen? This 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 state is three quarters water and the other quarter swamp, and uh, maybe two percent mountain, right? And hills. So it happens, right? We take the time to make sure that you have some basic first aid, then. Rated communications or how do you communicate with emergency help if you need it, right? Have that that preparation. For Ryrie, it's a cell phone. If we're on a boat, channel 17, right, or channel 86. Uh, we want to make sure that we, we understand what, what that is, right? And then uh, uh, if we do get on the radio, how does that look? Josh, what should, we, the captain died. Everybody else is drowning or drowned. And you're on the boat. You grab the radio. What do you say? Um. Yeah, I mean, you need to communicate. There's an emergency. So, I mean, what do say, you say? Help, clearly communicating what happened and what kind of help you need. Um, where you know your location. Any any other information you have. Good. So the key words is mayday, mayday, mayday. Um, that's the the first thing out of your mouth. And then you're exactly right. We have an emergency situation at this location. This is what I see, because you probably won't have grid coordinates for it or GPS, but at least try and get them to where you're at. We're on this boat. We're here. We're Here's what's going on. The captain just died of Ebola, and uh, everybody else drowned because they were eaten by manatees, whatever it is, right? But be clear. Good job. That's exactly right, though. And then finally, we want to make sure before we do our dive, like we talked about, dive your plan and plan your dive, have an accident management plan ahead of time. What happens if? What happens if this happens? What happens if that happens? So those are some of the key pieces of this um, that uh, we want to be aware of and how that works. Make sense, guys? Yep. 
So in open water, guys, I certified you guys to dive how deep? 60 feet. 60 feet, exactly. So as we go through this process, uh, we really kind of look at three different kinds of dive profiles. Your general open water dive profiles are going to be your zero to 60 feet. That's going to be your fun reefs, easy dives, light drifts, no big deal, right? Um, I like to call them the, you know, the toughest park. I usually call them Central Park um, uh, dives. They're, they're pretty simple. They're pretty easy to go. But we have the next level of dive where we start getting into that, that next potential of issues. Um, we start 18 to 30 meters or 60 to 100 feet. And in that process, we started to get into a more dynamic idea of having to make sure we're doing a safety stop, making sure we're taking, to, taking into account a slow ascent. We're taking into account um, additional pressure and the pressure gremlins that definitely arise through that process. And then finally, we start getting into those adventure dives. And for you guys, those adventure dive levels are really going to be that 100 to 130 feet um, as we start getting down. So we start, need to make, uh, start making uh, basic preparations and understand what does that look like? What is that going to feel like? So interesting enough, there's a, a study out, and this is from Dan, and they, they came up with the idea. They, they started studying, can we build tolerance to nitrogen narcosis? What do you guys think? That's a yes. Just like anything, the more you utilize it, the more your body's going to react to it. Okay. Josh, what do you think? Tolerance build up to nitrogen narcosis? Yeah. I think, I think you can build up a tolerance to it. I don't think you could ever completely get rid of it, but. No. <laughs> You there? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I missed your whole answer. Can you build up a tolerance to nitrogen narcosis? Yeah. I mean, at the very least, I think you can learn to recognize it more in yourself, but I think your body will probably, you know, learn to tolerate it the more you do it, but I don't think you'll ever, you know, fully be immune to it. Okay. Ryan, what do you think? Tolerance to it? I'm going to be devil's advocate and say no. We may have lost Ryan. Can you hear me? No. He's, he's here. Oh, he's talking? Yeah. Can you hear me, Ben? That's funny. I do not hear him at all. How about now, Ben? There we go. I can hear you now. Yay. What do you think, Ryan? What's your thoughts process? I said I'm going to play devil's advocate and say no. We cannot build up a tolerance to it. Well, you would be in line with the current research. The current Sweet. research says that uh, we don't so much build up a tolerance to nitrocosis. We overlearn skills and proficiencies at those skills with experience to be able to overcome them. So it's it, the idea is, is that um, we don't become um, tolerant to alcohol when we're diving or when we're drinking. What we do is become good at understanding the tasks that are required of us is that's the late now that's the latest research from dan um it's certainly it's it's a debatable subject but what we're finding is that um i'm not going to give you a, help you build up a tolerance to it i'm going to help you build up an understanding of it so that you'll understand what it feels like how to prepare for it as well as the skills that you are using while diving to that depth that you're more um uh, adept at them and you're able to handle those skills more naturally through muscle memory. Now on the argument side of that, um, in reading a, a recent article about Sheck Exley, and I don't know if anybody here uh, knows that name or not. He was a world famous cave diver, probably the most famous cave diver ever. He died in a cave accident at 806 feet in a cave. But in when the doctors did a physical examination of Mr. Exley, they determined him uh, to be extremely uh, nitrogen tolerant. So it was definitely interesting to see that in the medical reports that uh, Jack Exley was extremely nitrogen uh, tolerant. Now, interestingly enough, we do have uh, Sheck Exley to thank for one piece of dive gear all of us carry. Anybody know what that is? Just trivia for fun for today.
Sorry, I can't get over Ryan's uh, <laughs> mic there. I can fix that. There we go. So the check actually did what did something for the diving uh, that we we can all thank for, and we all carry. What's what, what do you think Sheck actually added to diving? I don't know, probably a uh, component to the regulators. He added the safety second. So without Sheck Hexley back in the 80s saying, hey, wait a minute, buddy, breathing doesn't work. Don't do that. It's bad. It's stupid. Let's add a second regulator. It's not that big a deal. It's extra 200 bucks, man. At this point, it's an extra 600 bucks, but okay. Right. Um, so that's, we have Sheck Hexley. That's your trivia for the day. Sheck Hexley is uh, definitely an interesting read to go through, but as we kind of go through this, my goal through this process is to help develop skills in such a way that you guys will have a better understanding how to use those skills, more comfortable and memory, muscle memory in those skills uh, as we go through this. So in deep diving, uh, we start getting the idea that we're going to go through gas a lot faster. I have a visual for you guys. I hope you like my visual. This is, this is new. Nobody's seen this before except for... Uh, the 10 year old class that I just did. So this is a sponge, just in case you're wondering what it is. It's one of my wife's scrubby sponges that I, yes, I cut it into this little piece, but it's a good way to represent the air we breathe. About 21% of the air we breathe is oxygen, is oxygen. 79% is nitrogen. You know, y'all with me so, so far? Yep. All right. So here's the thing. If this takes up we're going to say, we're going to call this two square inches of act, two cubic inches of actual space it's taking up. If we go to 33 feet, now we can fit, because it uh, because of pressure, it squeezes it. We're now able to fit two sponges, two molecules of the air we breathe into the same amount of space. Make sense? If we go to 66 feet, we're able to fit three of these molecules of the air we breathe into the same amount of space. You guys copy with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if this is one or two cubic inches, and this is two cubic inches, and this is two cubic inches, it takes up, it takes me a lot longer to use, uh, to use this. But if it's all together in this, I can go through a lot more of these much, much more quickly. So what I'm saying is that at the surface, I go through two cubic inches of air. At 66 feet, I go through six cubic inches of air because it compresses. So now how does that affect, what does that mean to our sac rate, Josh? Yeah, I mean, it's going to increase the deeper you go. Absolutely, because the, the molecules of air are compressed. Um, we have uh, Boyle and Dalton to thank for that. They're kind of each one of them in that, that dynamic. But uh, Dalton's really the... Uh, the overall one we get to blame for uh, um, for the partial pressure laws, but uh, that's that's the idea. So as we start descending in, we need to make sure we're taking into account surface air consumption. Makes sense. And so some of the factors of that surface air consumption are going to be a the easiest one: how deep are we going? But uh, James, what's another factor that we need to be aware of in terms of surface air consumption? For ourselves on um, the exertion that you're using absolutely the stress level of the diver the exertion right i'm going to give you uh, two points for that one um josh what have you noticed as you've become more comfortable in diving what have you noticed about your sac rate yeah it's gone down i breathe i breathe less there absolutely the experience so we definitely want to make sure we're taking into account the experience of the diver um as uh, as David would, uh, I believe, would attest, um, my sack rate is is substantially lower than his. Right? Would you agree with that, David? I mean, a little. I'm getting there. You're getting there. You're you're doing a much. You're doing a great job. But we're also uh, and I, but I've also got a lot more dives on you. So I go through a lot less. But I've done this a lot. I'm very comfortable in the water. So the experience level of the diver. Um, how about fitness level? Do you think that might have something to do with things? I don't know. Brett does pretty good with uh, his stack rate, too. And he's a little bit rounder than I am. He's got more experience than you, but I can, I I can tell you from personal experience, I've got about half of uh, Brett's sack rate. Um, but I'm in better shape as well. And and uh, it definitely 
it's it's definitely different, right? Physical fitness. When I'm when I'm working out and I'm really doing my running, I I process air and oxygen um, much more efficiently and much better. My body processes and gets in that shape. So physical fitness of a diver absolutely makes a big difference as well. How about physical size, Josh? If you and I were the same amount of ex experience, because you're a little bit bigger than I am, but not by a lot, do you think we'd still go through the same amount of gas? Um. I mean, yeah, the bigger person most likely has bigger lungs too. So, absolutely, my wife goes through less gas than I do because she's smaller. Um, it just is what it is. My lungs are about two point two liters. Hers are about, and mine are probably about the average male. Um, the average female is about one point eight liters. So, guys, if you dive with a girl, at some point, if you're not beating her when you first start, she at some point we she'll uh, just uh, wipe the floor with you when it comes to sack rate. What do you think other things that are, are going to affect your sack rate? We already talked about depth, uh, workload, uh, stress, experience. What are some other things? Uh, food, what you eat, what you drink. Absolutely. Absolutely is a, a, one of the things. That's a, a good one to bring up. Uh, for example, a good one to kind of be aware of, Gatorade. Gatorade is a really bad one to drink before a dive. Simple enough, it plumps up the walls of the blood cells that carry oxygen and doesn't allow it to trans your body to transport oxygen through your system because they're all plumped up with liquid as easily. You will reduce your sac rate by drinking Gatorade. So there's your pro tip for the day. That's something that uh, you'll probably never see Gatorade on a tech boat. Uh, at least I've never seen Gatorade on a tech boat because that's kind of a, one of the inside secrets of tech divers, right? Um, breathing habits is another one. And then um, depth of the dive. How about temperature? Um, do you think temperature has something to do with it? Is there an alternative to Gatorade that they do have on tech boats? Uh, water. Just water. <laughs> Just water. It's the only thing you'll ever really see on a deck boat. You might see juice like Kool Aid, um, uh, but uh, you'll you just uh, see everybody's drinking a lot of water. Um, it's the very best thing for your body. It's you're adding less least amount of chemicals to your body and sugar. Um, it's just, that's the absolute most common thing. Now, oddly enough, the most common snack food is either Ritz crackers or Oreo cookies I, or Chips Ahoy. I've seen a lot of Chips Ahoy too. Those are the three most common um, chips that I see on a dive boat. And I, but I don't know why that one is. That just, that's like industry-wide. It's probably because they're cheap and they're easy to get would be my guess. Um, and you'll see a lot of oranges, I, but you'll never see a banana, you should, at least on, a, on any real dive boat or any, any real boat, you'll never see a banana. So, so anybody know why that is? There's, there's an absolute reason for that. Cassian. Nope. Why you, why you'll never see a banana on a dive boat or that you shouldn't. Because of the potassium in them. Why do you think the potassium? Uh, Potassium does all sorts of things for the transport of your blood. Nope, so I don't know exactly. what it has to do with diving, but I have to assume that it it causes an uptick in transporting something. Nope, not at all. It has nothing to do with the potassium. I want to see what your thought process is. I was just curious. Josh, why do you think you don't see a banana on a dive boat? Yeah, I mean, I would have went with David on potassium just because it. Uh, I know potassium is one of the chemicals that uh, – affect neuron firing no i I, um, I love trivia like this james you know um it's probably got something to do with high blood pressure i'm assuming no nope. it's bad luck um if you have a, <laughs> uh, if you have a banana on a boat um the boat will die um and won't start or get stuck somewhere and the reason being is back in the 1800s when they were transporting bananas you put enough bananas together they create a ra radioactive charge and they would cause they cause thyroid cancer to the sailors um, but the sailors didn't know that that was what was happening because they didn't understand what radiation was in any way, shape, or form. All they knew was that bad shit happened when they put a bunch of bananas on a boat. So to this day, bananas are bad mojo on boats. So there's your useless fact of the day. Uh, enjoy, um, share that, share and uh, trip with your friends. So let's talk about that. I'm going to add that to my boat diving course. There you go. It's yeah. a good one. It's And it's absolutely true. Look it up. Um, so... And I have been on boats where somebody brought a banana on and the captain flipped out, grabbed their banana and threw it off, off the board. They, they looked at him like he was crazy. He says, you don't bring a goddamn banana on my freaking boat. 
I mean, he tossed it hard too. Like it was a grenade. I was like, nice. <laughs> but so pro tip for you today, don't take banana on a diet boat unless you want to piss off the skipper. Um, and the skipper's the last person you want to pick, piss off because he is the one picking you up after the dive. And I'm just saying it's a long swim usually to shore. So be aware. Let's jump back into it. But temperature of water. Dave, you've dove cold water with me a little bit now. Cold oh, water yeah. Sap, saturate a little bit? Oh, it, it has a tendency to do Absolutely. So as we go through this and we start doing our dive planning, we definitely need to make sure we take into those accounts. What is it going to take to plan our dive correctly? How is the sack rate going to look? And what are we going to do to make sure that we're uh, building our sack rate correctly? Right. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. So I'm going to let's see. Dang it. Accidentally click on something by mistake, and you're like, dang it, I didn't mean to do that. All right, Ryan is obviously back. There we go. Sorry, I, I closed my little presentation by accident. Complete accident here. So let's see. And now I can't get off this slide. What the heck? There it goes. So let's talk a little dive planning for sack rate. It's in my opinion, a very underrated and, and underappreciated uh, feature of what we do. Um, we talk about this in a lot of classes. And the good news is this way of creating your sack rate build, uh, we use this uh, from here on through tech. So it's pretty important for you to have a good understanding. We've just got, David, I've got you up what, two times now. <laughs> All right, let's see. Take me just a second. I accidentally closed my presentation, so I'm so sorry. So I've got to get to the right page on my sacrate. Rich Cygnus. Water diver. And there we go. All right, so determine our sacrate. There's a couple ways we can certainly do this. I'm going to give you guys the simple one now. And in a little bit, we're going to give we're going to get a little bit more in detail. We're going to uh, pull out some paper. So I'm going to remove that. What the heck is going on with that? That's weird. Okay. Uh, let's see. Share screen. So here's how we're going to basically figure out our sack rate. Uh, we're going to use we're just going to use the idea of an 80 cubic foot cylinder. But this the good news is a sack rate, a sack rate, a sack rate. So guys, let's start off with where should we figure out our sack rate at? The surface. Yeah, it's right in the name, right? It's kind of like Custer's Gray Horse. Um, sack rate is surface air consumption rate. Now I promise you that the book makes this substantially more difficult than it really needs to be. Um, it also talks about, in my opinion, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a numbers guy. Um, I live in a, a world of numbers that it starts you at an imperfect place. Now, Ryan, David, uh, Josh, James, you've all done a few dives at this point. Have you ever had two dives that were exactly the same in effort, sack rate, work, and time and depth? No. No. No? How weird. That is, that's just plat out strange. I don't understand that. Um, because the book ex explains that uh, you need to do your sack rate at depth on a dive. And the problem with that is, is how do you do that on a dive if all dives are different? So what I want you guys to do is um, with a tank and a mask, simply enough, we talked about the sport, sit in a normal position at home with your tank and your mask on, measure the PSI prior to starting, breathe in through that regulator for 20 minutes. By the way, please take pictures of this. For the love of God, to take pictures while you do this. I had somebody do it of their kid one time doing it. I had a 12-year-old doing the class, and they took pictures of their kid doing it. He fell asleep while he was watching TV. It was awesome. Um, measure the volume. Well, he got a crazy good sack rate, though. He was yeah, I, I really like that. He did. Um, measure the volume and PSA at the end. Um, divide by the total minutes. Repeat this three times. That will give you your sack rate, your, uh, your lung volume sack rate. Simple enough, guys? Breathe, measure over course of time. Do it three times on average. Once you've done that, now you can determine what your sack rate is going to be for a dive. Easiest way to do this, you're going to go out and dive. And we know that, for example, our sack rate is 25 PSI per minute. 
I'm just using a random number. That's not my sack rate. It's not anybody's sack rate. Pick the number that was easy to map to work with. All we need to do, uh, if you guys have your paper with you, is if we're going to do a dive to 33 feet, we multiply 25 PSI per minute by the atmospheric pressure at 33 feet. Ryan, how many atmospheres are we at 33 feet? Two. Exactly. So simply enough, multiply two times 25 equals 50, right? Now, James was really astute, and I'm, I'm really brought, glad you brought that up. Um, we also have to figure out the effort of the dive. So if it's a nice, easy dive, we're diving warm, three mil wetsuit, it's probably going to be one and a quarter to one and a half. If it's cold and we're doing a lot of effort, it could be up to three. Heavy effort could be four to five. Driving a dry suit in a heavy current, um, trying to manipulate gear in a tech setup, you could be four, you could be five. So we're going to say we're in the Caribbean diving, a nice warm dive. We're, get, we're working on getting back to that margarita that's waiting for us on shore. Mar virgin margarita, of course, because that's all I drink. Um, so we're going to drink that mar virgin margarita. So 50 PSI times one and a half equals 75 PSI per minute on an 80 cubic foot tank. Easy enough. Does that make pretty good sense, guys? So that's the key. That, that will give you your sack rate for the tank that you measure. Um, and you can do it simply in PSI. It's really that simple. Definitely none of this is rocket science when we do this, but understanding your basic sack rate is definitely going to be a good thing to know. Um, it can absolutely be converted into uh, liters as well, and there's a way to absolutely do that. Uh, let's see here. And I will show you. I actually have a spreadsheet for this. Um, because I got tired of doing the math, and I, I'm a very much big believer in uh, work smarter, not harder, as my dad would flick me in the forehead and say. So let's sh share this presentation. And you guys are welcome. I would be happy to send my spreadsheet to you if you wanted to. Um, this is just one I created. So with my spreadsheet here, what we can do is we can say we're diving to 100 feet. We're in Idaho Falls which the barometric pressure in Idaho Falls right now is 0.81 as we look at it, gives us a new theoretical depth of 119 feet. Now, if you're taking altitude diving with me on Thursday, um, you will understand that math a lot more easily once we get done with that. Um, we're going to do a dive for 20 minutes. Runtime is going to be 20 minutes, and we're diving at 11.1 .1 liter tank. Now, James, thank you so much for asking. How did I come up with 11.1 11, 11 meter tank? That was very astute of you. I appreciate it. Um, every tank has a liter size. I happen to have over here on another page every liter size of every tank that's pretty much uh, made. So if we go to a Catalina 80 that holds 3,000 3, PSI, we can see that it's 11.1 .1 liters. But you guys might think, hey, wait a minute, Benjamin, don't you dive 100 cubic foot? High pressure tank? I do, as a matter of fact. Let's go ahead and find that one. That happens to be a, a Faber uh, HP 100. It holds 12.9 liters. And Josh, I know you just you just you were thinking, but don't you have some 117s as well? I do, as a matter of fact, Josh. Thank you for asking. You, you guys like how I read mine through this course? It's pretty impressive, I think. I don't. I was thinking about the uh, the 149. 149. I just happen to have that too. I don't have a 149. And I think uh, anybody that gets one right is, is, is slightly retarded, but that's that's my personal opinion. That's 18.98 liters of gas. That's a ton of freaking gas, dude. But we can put that in if you want. 18.98 um, liters of gas in our ga gas planning sheet. 18.98 liters of gas. And that's an HP tank. Uh, da -da -da. Yep, just making sure. And... We got a good Ashley fill for this day, so we got it up to 3,300. My sack rate is nine. We're gonna do a nice easy dive of one and a half. Uh, we can pop down here, and because of um, life being simple and easy, we can multiply PSI times 0 0.06894. Um, if you'd like me to uh, uh, give that to you again, it's 0 0.06894. We'll convert it to bar. So that 18.98 liter tank holds. 227 bar, which gives you 4,318 liters of freaking gas. That is a lot of gas. That is a ton of freaking gas, dude. Um, so, and then from here, we can also figure out our sack rate. 
How do we figure our sack rate? It's very simple. Let's see. Do I have a whiteboard? I don't have a whiteboard. Let me pull up a document here. Let's see. What can I get rid of? Uh, just give a new one. And if I'm getting over your head, guys, say so. Please, please, please. So the first thing we need to do to figure out our sack rate on our tank is we need to figure out in bar. So as we're breathing out our tank, we need to know, okay, I've got an 11, uh, an 80 cubic foot tank, which is 11.1 liters. And I know that if I, um, it's filled up to 3,000 PSI, so I just need to multiply that by 0 0.06894. Anybody got their cal calculator? Can you beat me on that? Can you make those uh, that font larger for us? I can't actually read what that says. I'd be happy to. Thank you for uh, mentioning. Perfect. Oh, I'll, I'll get you all the way there, buddy. So 0 0.0694 equals 206.82. 206.82 bar. So we're going to round down to 206 bar. How many liters in this tank? Here's where it gets easy. We're going to multiply 11.1 times 206 bar. So 206 times 11.1 .1 equals an 80 cubic foot tank has 2,000. 286 liters of gas in it. Now, you might be wondering, why would we want to know how many liters of gas in any tank that we're breathing is, right? Are you guys asking that same question? No? I Nobody wants to know? Okay, we should be. Uh, because here's why. is If I start off with 2,000 PSI in my tank, uh, when I'm doing this... Uh, calculation that we just talked about and I end at 1500 PSI I can say okay what does that equal out so times 0 0.06894 equals 2000 times 0 0.06894 equals 137 bar I'm going to make this just a little smaller, David. I'm sorry I went too big. There we go. That's okay. And 1,500 PSI times 0 0.06894 equals uh, 0.06894 equals 103 bar. But what's the difference between what's our mathematical 103 minus 137? Would it be 34? Is that right, guys? 103 minus 130. What were the numbers? What 137 minus 103 is 100. Is there is 34 bar? Thirty-four. Right. 137 minus 103. We'll just say is 34 bar. Easy enough. So we take that and we divide that by our 20 minutes. So 34 divided by 20 minutes equals 1.7 liters per minute. Or, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My, my bad. Bar per minute. Or 1.7 times 11.1 .1 equals... So that's thir uh, equals 1.7 bar per minute. All we need to do is take that 1.7 and multiply it by the 11.1 .1 liters in the tank. And we now know that our, our sack rate is 21 liters per minute. Easy enough? Now, I don't expect you guys to memorize this at this point, but I wanted to at least introduce you to a different way to calculate gas and understand that if we do it in metric, it's a lot more accurate. Now, here's why. Um, if I know that I breathe 21 liters per minute of gas, I can take this calculation and I can apply it to 
a 30 cubic foot tank, a 149 cubic foot tank, a 100 cubic foot tank, it won't matter. I still breathe 21 liters per minute, period. That's my sack rate. But, James, if I if I figure out my sack rate at 20, uh, 20 PSI per minute on an 80 cubic foot tank, is will that be the same on a 100 cubic foot tank and a 117 foot cubic foot tank? Well, your consumption rate is going to be the same. But will I go through 17 PSI a minute? If my, if my sack rate is 17 PSI a minute, period, no, I know that is... Will it your be PSA rate PSI? that you're breathing is going to be less. It's going to be reduced because you're going to have higher compression in it. You're exactly. going to have a higher volume. Yeah, you have higher volume. So I can't use that same 17 PSI a minute from a 80 cubic foot tank to 100 cubic foot tank to 117 to any other tank. I can only use that that 20 PSI per minute that I've come up with in my living room on the on the same size and dynamic tank as what I did my test on. So what if you didn't use PSI per minute, but you used cubic feet per minute? Because bar is the equi- is the metric equivalent of PSI. Unfortunately, the math doesn't add. It doesn't come out the same. So play with it, absolutely. Go, go forth and play with it. Uh, what you'll find is the it doesn't, it doesn't equate out the same um, as when you pull it to bar in liters. So, Doing it in bar and liters is substantially easier, and it actually adds through every single time. So go through and play with it. Absolutely. I, I definitely encourage that. But what I did is, if, if you guys would like, I've got a, a, sack, um, a gas planning worksheet as well as a sack planner. If you guys go out and do a 100-foot dive. <laughs> yeah. I had one do that. Girls. If you do a 1,000-foot dive, a you know, 100-foot dive, and the average depth of your dive was – 63.2 feet and you dove for you know 42 minutes on 21 percent oxygen and your work factor was 1.5 and your your tank size was 11.1 you started at 3600 and ended at 2000 psi your liters per minute will be 4.62 your average liters per minute will be 6.39 total psi per minute at depth was 8 p 8 psi a minute so It'll give you everything that you need. There's a few other uh, calculations in here that uh, you guys aren't ready for, to be honest with you. And one of them is your equivalent ni- narcotic depth, in case you're wondering what um, end in meters was. Um, that's your equivalent narcotic depth. Um, it's for a later class when you can start getting a depth into tech. Again, I don't want you guys to memorize this, but I want you at least to be exposed to the idea that as we build up our sac rate, we need to make sure that we understand that when we do our sac rate calculations, that it won't be to every cylinder we might dive. It'll be to the cylinder that we measure. Does it make sense? James, you, you copy? Or did I lose everybody? I'm here. No, we're here. Okay, just making sure every copies. Does that make sense, James? Like we kind of went down the rabbit hole for a little bit, but I wanted to at least expose you to um, a different thought process and, and a, a different why. Yep. No, I got it. Okay. It's um, what do you do for work, James? Loss prevention. Okay. So you're into math as well. So uh, we can certainly go down that rabbit hole and, and um, be aware of the things as we go through that, but be aware that, as you guys do your sac rate calculations, it will definitely have a variance across the board, if, especially if you do it the SSI way. So um, next thing kind of be, uh, to be aware of as we're starting getting in, into deep dive planning, we want to make sure we're taking the time to be aware of the environmental conditions. Josh, why do you think that um, those environmental conditions might be important to us? Um, well, I mean, the conditions at depth could be different than the conditions on the surface. Sure. How would that, why would that be important? Give me a situation why that would be important. Well, I mean, if there's a heavy current down, uh, down deeper or above you, then you need, kind of need to know that uh, and plan your dive effectively. Absolutely. Um, what other environmental conditions have we run into, David, that would be important to know ahead of time? Uh, cold water, moving water. Uh, 
inexperienced dive buddies. And uh, I like that you you added the dive, inexperienced dive buddies to environmental conditions because it kind of is. <laughs> they kick up that bottom, and that absolutely turns environmental really quickly. Yes, it does so, absolutely. <laughs> it increases increase your sack rate when you have to chase them down too. <laughs> yeah. I, I hadn't ever thought of a dive buddy as an environmental condition, but I, I think I might from this point out. So I like that. So definitely making sure we understand what the environmental conditions, what, what is it going to take to get back on the daggum boat? You know, is, is it storming? Is it snowing? I can tell you, I've been on dives in uh, uh, Redfish Lake in June where um, I was diving wet gloves and it felt good getting in the 38 degree water because the water temperature felt warmer than the air temperature. My, my fingers were going numb because it was so cold. And getting in the 38 degree water was was awesome. I, on that same dive, um, I popped at the surface and it was a complete whiteout. You couldn't see 20 feet on the surface because of all the freaking snow. So we deal with it probably a lot more in some ways than others. But when you get out to Florida, there's I've been on uh, out there more than once where I didn't get to go on a a dive because of a freaking hurricane decided to blow its stupid butt in. Um, in fact, it ended up, uh, Nick and I ended up having to wait six months to finish our tech, one of our tech courses because we just couldn't get all the dives in because of the stupid freaking hurricane. You know, I can't believe it decided to come in while we were here. Couldn't wait a week, but you know, be aware. Environmental conditions are definitely going to be play a part in this. And remember, we're since we are diving deeper, more gremlins and more problems uh, and possibilities start to become apparent. Um, not only because of the gremlins, because of depth, because of other issues that we're having to deal with and emergencies that could arise. Next thing is that we want to be aware of communication. James, why do you think communication and deep dive planning would be reasonably important? Well, if we don't speak the same language, uh, the information is not going to get passed on correctly. Absolutely. So, James, if I, I don't know if you guys can see me. I'm going to go ahead and put myself back on the screen. Yep, there we go. So, James, I gave you this symbol. What do you think I'm trying to tell you? Point. Say again? Rally point or on me. Exactly. On the surface, that's what it means. But um, on a dive, that means turn the dive. We're turning the dive. How about this? You're asking for time consumption rate, how much oxygen you have left? Nope. This would be how much oxygen, but this would be halfway. I'm at half. And so it's interesting. You know, there's there's things that you would think would be inherently the same as across the across the porch. But as on diving, there's definitely a few ones that are different. Turn the dive. Short of the left. Short of the right. I'm at halfway. What are we going to do? Turn the dive. So definitely some different communication. So understanding that kind of stuff, because if I'm telling you this and I turn around and go the other way, you don't notice that. That can be definitely a problem. So communication can be huge. How much gas do you have? How about this one, guys? James, do you know this one? What, a little hook? Yep, my finger in, in the, the pinky T position. No. I'm asking where you're at on Deco. So if we're doing a Deco stop or we're doing a, a safety stop, and I want to know how much time do you have left on your deco or your safety stop? I'll give you that. And I'll say, hey, I just say, because you may have a five minute safety stop uh, to make sure we're safe, especially since we're going deeper. The deeper we go, the more uh, prevalent we're going to need to use a longer safety stop. So I want to know where you're at on your on your safety stop. Are you done? And then finally, um, Josh, I'm going to pick on you for a little bit. I picked on James plenty for right now. I won't pick on you for at least a minute and a half, two minutes, James. Um, so that was funny. Come on, work with me. This must be a long question. So, Josh, I do this. What am I telling you? That's uh, cleared for your safety stop for your yeah. deco. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. I've, I've cleared my safety stop. Josh, why do you think I do it on both hands? Uh, for both computers. If you have to. Exactly. I, I wear two computers. So if you're only one wearing a computer, you might just see somebody do it. They get your attention. I'm clear. If you see me do um, clear. Now, why would it be important, David, for me to be clear on both computers? You always want to use the most conservative of your options. Absolutely. So as we go through this process, if you are diving two computers, which I encourage, 
Um, one is none, two is one. Especially when you get into tech, you always dive two computers. It's um, well for the class that's not required. It, it is extremely highly, highly encouraged to have two separate computers. Um, one is none, two is one. Especially what you find is you get down to the 150 foot depth and a computer dies and you don't have a timing device of some kind. As David will tell you, a timing device can't be important. And it's kind of embarrassing when you're where your instructor um, and you're trying you're trying to be a dive master and your instructor says, where's your timing device? You say, I don't have one. And he has to hand you a watch, right? Have you ever seen that happen, David? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm just checking. Thought maybe I thought maybe you'd see me do that to somebody one time, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Might have like on you. <laughs> if I don't pick on you, it means I don't like you. <laughs> hey, I, I finally got one. You know, I you, did. you did. You so. did. And, and uh, definitely a backup is a good way to go. That's for sure. So the key point about this is, is making sure that we're able to properly communicate one with another, that I know what your signals are and you know what my signals are. Now, the good news is, is a lot of these are pretty common across diving. Deco, halfway, turn the dive, gas, one through five, six through six through nine. Those are pretty common. You, you'll you find that if you go diving in Europe, you're going to see those same things. If you go dive in Japan, you're going to see those same basic signs. So while we may, I may be on a Japanese dive boat, they only speak Japanese and I only speak English, we're still going to be able to get a few basic ideas. Are you okay? Where's your gas? 2,900. Good. You know, I'm at halfway. Let's turn the dive. You know, so you get a couple of basic ideas that are always going to be the same across. Um, and as we go through, um, there's another one. As we're starting yeah, to go down, do it. yes, sir. Your your angle is kind of funny. Are you doing a like a timeout T? I'm doing a timeout T. Sorry, okay. I'm doing timeout T. Okay. So if you just see somebody do a timeout T, that means I'm half half my gas is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay. The so. the angle is just a little weird, and I I kept thinking you were doing this one, and I was like. Four minutes left on your safety stop and nope. then, yep. so i just wanted to clarify that one so for safety stop i'm going to tell you three minutes four minutes five minutes now yep. it, when we get into deco we change that a little bit we we add something more we say deco three minutes deco three zero 30 minutes you know but we say deco two minutes yeah 27 minutes right so we start getting we we use that and then after we we clear deco then we go into safety stop. But this is when I give you the timeout T that's halfway right. So we go through we we communicate that we want to make sure we understand all the pieces of what that looks like uh, and where we're going to. There's another one. Anybody seen this one before? Go up to the next safety or deco stop. Go up to the next level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then finally, my favorite one. <laughs> You've hurt my feelings. <laughs> Just kidding. We don't actually use that one, but it's definitely fun to do once in a while. So we want to make sure we're communicating clearly so that we know what those symbols are, what's going on, where things are at. Because without that, we're not going to be able to clearly communicate everything we need to know. Simple enough? Um, I'm not going to go over, does everybody have a pretty good idea of uh, flying after diving? Do I really need to go through that? One hour for every thousand feet of altitude. There you go. So simple enough. Um, the other one we're going to do, we're adding something new, guys, to our, our diving. Uh, as we're starting going to diving, we're going to add a new one. We're going to stop. Once we descend three to five to 10 feet, we're going to stop and you're going to see me do this. Josh, what am I asking when I do this? To so get a crowd out. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> this is for bubble check. So one of the things we want to make sure we're doing that we're going out, we're stopping at about three, five to 15 feet. Anywhere in that is acceptable. It depends on where we're at. If we're in the ocean, it's going to be about 15 feet. If we're in a Ryrie or a shore dive, 
It's going to be anywhere from three, five, six, seven feet in that area, just so where we're deep enough where we can still pop on the surface easily, but before we start our dive. We're going to stop, and we're going to do a bubble check. What does that look like? David, you want to tell me what a bubble check looks like? You might have seen one before. Uh, buddy asks for a bubble check. Uh, the receiver turns around exposes the back of the equipment. Buddy examines tank from top to bottom, down each hose, and uh, either says, yes, you got bubbles from this, or no, you have bubbles, you're clear. Exactly. And we do it to – you You and your buddy will check each other. So I will – if David and I are di uh, diving together, I'll say, stop, bubble check, me. And he'll, David will look at me, give me a turnaround. Okay, I'm going to slowly turn around because I want him to see all my, and look me up and down looking for bubbles. Once he gives me the okay, you, bubble check. David will go ahead and give me a, spit, a turn around, and I'll look for bubbles on him as well. As I'm look, uh, looking for bubbles, we're, we're good to go. Let's – Descend, so we can go ahead and start our descent. That's another thing we're gonna we add. Um, it's not in the book, uh, by the way, guys. What you'll find is about seventy percent of what is in the book is stuff I will not talk about. Um, you are all big boys and put on. I assume every put very put big boy pants on today. So I'm gonna assume that you are able to read and and take and gather that information. Um, and there's about forty percent stuff I will talk about that you will not find in the book. So. Just be aware. Um, I go through things a little more depth in depth. I also tend to take this from a more technical per, per, uh, perspective as well. But that's my passion and what I like to do. So um, the good news is, is if you take the deep dive class with me, you'll you'll have been exposed to technical ideas. So bubble check. Ryan, what do you think a bubble check might be important? So you can catch big issues before they become bigger. Um, Absolutely. Like, go deeper, we'll be more and more dangerous. Absolutely. So now on the deep dive course with you guys, just to kind of set some expectation. I definitely work as an instructor on this portion. Um, I'm a I'm your dive master, dive guide, instructor. I'm right where with you. You guys will be under direct supervision. This is the last deep dive class that that happens on. I'm my goal is to bring you guys to the level that you guys are 100% big kids. And you graduate to that point where I'm no longer your dive master, dive guide instructor, but I am now just the guardian angel and um, evil gremlin of your dive group. That is so. Just be aware. This is the last time that I act um, in a deep dive class that I act as your instructor slash direct contact person. So as we go through this, that's kind of exciting. Is this the last time I act like that for you in a deep dive class? Now, night limited biz. Or other things like that, um, I still have to require to do that. But once we move over to decompression diving and extended range, I am absolutely uh, believe that if you're in a decompression uh, diving class, that I don't need to stand on top of you. So be aware. It's kind of kind of exciting for you guys, right? All right. So as we start um, doing these dives, you guys will need to make sure that you're planning all these dives within the no decompression limits. David. What's the simplest way to plan a no deco dive? The simplest way to plan a non deco dive is the uh, U.S. Navy dive tables. Absolutely. Everybody got their uh, um, phone where they can get to it very easily? Yep. All right. If you would, open the My SSI app, please. Alexa. Working on 40%. There we go. Maybe that, nope, that didn't help either. I thought that would help, but not so much. All right. Oh, there's an, by the way, there is an update to the app. So once you get in the app, if you would, go to the more button. And once you hit the more button, there is a green line that says tables. I don't think you can see it. It's right over here. Um, If you put it really close to the camera, it'll focus on that instead of the background. There you go. I think it's this, the screens. Um, I've got uh, two good size screens. So you're looking for, there we go, tables. Ooh, that's kind of freaky. So tables, once you're in tables,
you're looking for the combined air nitrox tables. Please, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and open those up in U.S. Imperial. It'll make your life a little easier. Now, having a copy of these with you on a dive site is definitely not a bad idea. Now, guys, there's a second way to do this to plan your dive with that you have with you, um, hopefully. What do you think another way I can go through and I can plan my dive to make sure I'm running a no decompression limit? Dive computer. Dive computer. I would encourage you, um, we do teach a computer diving course um, at the shop, um, but learn how to go into your specific computer, get into the dive planning mode. Dive setup, dive log. <laughs> Next, there, oh, just kicked right past it. Uh, system setup, da, 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 select gas, dive setup. There we go. Next, deco planner. I don't know if you can see that or not. There we go. Deco planner, that's my dive planner for there. And then I can hit plan my dive. And I can, it says that I can uh, change things around. So I want to do my depth at 90 feet, my time for 20 minutes. And it'll plan everything I need to know about this dive. Enter the bottom time in feet, minimum and maximum. And then I can hit next. Next, 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 next. My graded factor plan. And there's my whole dive plan. Whoop, there we go. So I go down to 90 feet. Run time is 20 minutes. Ascend from 90 feet. Total time of this dive would be 34 minutes. But you can do a, a, everything you need to know in your dive planner. I encourage you to pull the book out of your uh, out of wherever you've hidden it or got, gotten to, um, or download it from online, and uh, learn how to use the dive planner. It's definitely to your advantage. So as we're planning these dives, we definitely want to make sure we're doing a good no decompression plan of this and stay out of deco. Guys, you aren't gearing up for deco in this. We're just getting used to going deep. Next thing we want to do is we want to make sure we're doing our pre-entry buddy check. While we are responsible for ourselves, we are also um, with a dive buddy. And, and any way we can prevent them having problems is to our advantage, right, guys? Yeah, they're carrying your extra bottle. Absolutely. My my uh, Deco bottle usually has uh, lipsticks and feelings, right? Um, she's a very uh, – I love my dive buddy. So she's amazing. She has never had to bail me out yet, knock on wood. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, and I'll, I'll take that all day long. So after we do our buddy check, um, the easiest way to do a buddy check, by the way, I, I play the fun, fun game of head, shoulders, knees, and toes, and then I, where's your dive knife? How do you ditch your weights? Did you bring an SMB? Where's your second SMB? Uh, where's your second reel? Uh, making sure we have all the key pieces of this. Um, what are the, the service procedures? What happens if we get lost? What are we doing? Where are we getting ready? We make sure we're properly weighted. Um, we do a pre-entry buddy check. And then what are our service procedures? We go through and make sure we're planning everything accordingly. Now, one of the things I'm gonna encourage you guys to do through this process is make sure you stay with your buddy. As we're do, uh, diving with your buddy, we're gonna make sure we stop. Are you ready to go up? You ask them and then make sure that as we do our ascent, we're taking that time. Are you okay to go up? Swimming ascent, yes, yes. And then you're face to face. That way you have control. If something happens and they lose a weight pack on a weight pocket on the way up, you can reach out and grab them. If you lose a weight pocket, if suddenly somebody runs out of gas or has a catastrophic gas failure, um, I think uh, David might have seen a catastrophic gas failure one time with me. That remember that? I've seen a couple. That was uh, I don't know. Have you seen a couple? Where where else did you see one other than the neck ring blowing on my twins? Well, I guess I guess mine wasn't a catastrophic failure, but it, my I've had my regulator freeze and uh, the dry suit failure as well. Sure. On um, Aaron. So not so much a catastrophic gas failure, but definitely yeah. a, a concern. It could have been catastrophic if we hadn't dealt with it. Yeah. Exactly. So we want to make sure that we're taking that time that we're staying with our buddy and staying safe. So staying safe is definitely to your advantage. Let's stay safe on these dives. It doesn't hurt anything for a little extra safety. Um, 
so our uh, our descent procedures we're going to go down together. Our set procedures are going to be the same thing. Now, as we go through this process, I said this at the beginning, and I, and I hope I caught on it heavily heavily enough for you guys. But one of the biggest skills that you must master as the deeper you go and the longer you stay is going to be making sure that you're taking into account your buoyancy. Buoyancy and control of buoyancy is a major skill. David, you ever seen a, anybody have a buoyancy issue on a deep dive course? <laughs> a couple of times. Yeah, it happens. People get get off, off kilter and, and they start floating the surface way too fast. And the problem is, is it becomes an exponential failure, right? As you become one pound positive buoyant at 130 feet, now all of a sudden at 100 feet, you're six pounds positive. At 66 feet, you're 18 pounds positive. So buoyancy increases exponentially as you ascend. So controlling your buoyancy is key. Now I'd like to add something to that that's not in the book. And they talk about buoyancy. And so the problem is, is there's two parts of that really. There's buoyancy and there's trim. What's the difference, Josh? What's the difference between buoyancy and trim? Well, buoyancy is uh, basically whether if the water's pushing you up or down or if you're neutral in the water. Mm -hmm. And trim is basically your dive position. Absolutely. So you've started discovering the, the magic of the dive position. I've seen you getting a lot better. I'm very, I'm very proud of you, by the way. Um, <coughs> you're looking a lot better in the water. Um, you're still, there's still a lot of room to grow, but, um, and believe me, David started where, where you're at now, David absolutely was. And where uh, David's at now and where you're both at, I was at at one point, right? We, we're not born, born with perfect trim, right? But, Josh, what have you noticed as you dialed your trim in for things like gas rate, control, bouncing the surface, um, safety? Yeah, I mean, you're just you're a lot more comfortable in the dive position. Um, so you're, I mean, with comfort, you get better sack rates and things. Um, and you're able to better uh, kind of control where you are in the water instead of just constantly kind of flailing and stuff when you're out of dive position. Absolutely. You become less tired to the process, right? Um, and as you become less tired to this process, you go through less gas, you're safer. Um, I think we all have a pretty good understanding that when we get super tired, we don't always make the greatest decisions. The only thing we have going for us at this point is we've, we've gotten a little older and we understand, but when we were younger, make get tired and we made really bad decisions, right? So they were the best time to take your final exam is uh, staying up all night, right? So as we go through that process, the next thing you wanted to make sure is uh, as we're deep diving, because, because more problems can uh, creep in more easily, we want to make sure that we're monitoring our, our control systems. Um, are things like gas, depth, and time. So here's the rule of thumb that I use, and it's, it's served me well, um, is I check my gas about every two minutes or every time I see something interesting. That's the whole easiest thing I can tell you. I keep my computers on my wrist, and I look down about every two minutes, and I check where my gas is. A lot of times I can feel the gas, especially in the side mount. I can usually tell... Um, when I'm off by about 100 PSI on one of my tanks, I can feel it, right? But it's still a good idea to check and, okay, where am I at gas? So overall, monitor your gauge, orientation, and navigation. Reasonably important, a little bit important, not important at all, guys. What do you think? Well, especially navigation is important. If you're swimming south and you're supposed to be going north, there's a big problem there. <laughs> Absolutely. And so what do you think happens to your ability to make reasonable decisions when you get panicked because you think you're lost? Make stupid decisions and get yourself even more lost. Absolutely. A great example of that um, that I that I personally felt is there's places in Ryrie that I like to dive where you'll get out to about 130 feet, 125 feet in that area, and you'll start thinking you're coming back towards shore. The problem is that it'll start coming uphill because you think you're coming up the shore and then all of a sudden it'll start going back down Would that mess with your mind just a little bit if you thought if you might feel like you could not the ground yeah 
if you if you didn't know which way is north, south, east, or west, and you thought you were heading toward shore because you were going up, and all of a sudden the the incline started going back down, could that mess with your mind a little bit? Oh yeah, you'll turn around in a heartbeat. Absolutely, you're like, oh crap, I got I got I got missed I, something's wrong. So having a good idea of navigation and orienteering of where you're really at is definitely to your advantage. I had an interesting one, just a personal story. We were diving uh, um, uh, Stanley Lake um, a couple of years ago, and uh, we were out. And I I mapped it out, mapped out the dive before we went out, and I knew that the dive site was supposed to be 90 feet at the very center of the lake. And we got out, and we were about 80 feet, and all of a sudden we started rising again. And I was like, I kind of know where we're at and I've got my navigation going. We should not be going up. And we went up 25, 30 feet to about 60, 60, uh, 55 feet in that area. I was like, something ain't right here. But I, w I was curious where this went. And then if I really was at the other shore and then all of a sudden it leveled out and went back down again. I was like, huh, that's weird. And we had the exact same thing happen again. And again, we had it happen four times to us where we came up 25 feet. We went down, down 25 feet. It was like a rolling hill. What had happened is the year prior, there had been a major earthquake and it had liquefied um, the dirt underneath. But it had kind of done that, right? It, it had squeezed it together um, and liquefied it so that it all of a sudden it had rolling hills underwater. It had changed the depth of the lake from 95 feet to 80 feet at its de deepest, but it had given rolling hills. But I'll tell you what, that'll if I didn't have my compass with me, and I had a good understanding, it would have definitely, it, I mean, it was messing with my mind with a compass. Without a compass, it would have just screwed me over, right? I'd be like, ah, what the heck, right? So orienteering navigation is definitely to your advantage. Now, James, are you interested in taking the navigation course? I meant to ask you earlier. Um, we discussed something about taking the test you're talking about. Absolutely. If you would like um, to order up the course, um, what I do with that for somebody that um, is 11 bullet stopper or 0311, um, uh, I, I don't do that for the Air Force because I don't believe that they can find their, their way out of the, the bathroom with a compass, but uh, I, I will do that for Army and Marine Corps. Um, uh, I will, we sit down, I will ask you five questions. And at the end of five questions, if I feel comfortable, I'll, I'll sign you off. Um, you just have to go home and do the homework. Um, but I will sign your paper off. And once your homework is done, the, the certification goes through. Um, uh, typically, um, the couple of times that I've done this so far, um, the person has passed the exam, at, passed my five questions to my satisfaction. Um, it has taken about four or five minutes to answer the questions. So I am happy to do that for you, but uh, that's because you were, uh, you're a former 11 bullet stopper. So um, I don't do it for everybody. Um, David will tell you, I do not do that for everybody. So, um, but um, you have you have a previous MOS that I, I have a, a modicum of trust in that you know what a compass looks like. At least I, for love of God, I hope so. And again, like I said, I, I won't do that for the Air Force because I don't think that they they know how to, they know what a compass is. You guys want to hear an Air Force joke real quick? Sure. Do it. So the other day they had the four branches of the, the uh, military come together for a, a test, and the uh, the commander in chief got together and says. Guys, I got a question for you. What would you do if you found a scorpion in your tent? And the army guy said, well, I'd, I'd cut its stinger off and I'd eat it. And they're like, well, a little gross, but okay. The Marine says, I'd stomp the shit out of it with my boat, my boot, and then I'd kill it with my bayonet, and then I'd throw it outside, and then I'd eat it. They're like, overkill, but okay, I get it. The Navy guy says, I'd pick it up in something, and I'd throw it outside. And they're like, environmentally conscious. And the Air Force guy said, the first thing I do is I call room service and figure out why there was a tent in my room. So there you go. There's your Air Force joke for the day. Um, and that's recorded on YouTube for posterity. So one of the things we got to do is make sure we're uh, orienteering numbers. Make sure we're communicating with our buddy. What happens if we lose our buddy? Is that a thing that can happen? David, you ever lost a buddy? Oh, once or twice. <laughs> Josh, you ever been lost? Yeah. Absolutely. It happens. Well, I wasn't lost, but you yeah. were lost. You knew where you were at, but nobody else seemed to know, right? So, what happens if you lose lose your buddy? What's the procedure? Turn around in three sixty, look up and down, search for two minutes before you go up. Exactly. Now, here's the thing: you are now big kids, and and while that's the standard procedure, if that's not what's agreed upon between you and your dive buddy. 
That's not what's agreed upon. That is the safest procedure is one at uh, one minute for 360, uh, one to two turns. But you can agree upon it. Nikki and I have a, an agreement. If I don't find her for if I don't see her for 10 minutes, because she could be on one spire and I could be on another spire, and maybe she popped over somewhere else or I popped over somewhere else. If we don't see each other for 10 minutes, we go ahead and ascend to our safety stop and then we uh, finish our ascent. That's our agreement. But we're diving a lake. There's no current. We're both uh, very proficient divers. We're both solo certified, right? So we there's a few things that we have advantages to, right? We understand. Um, so that's that's our loss, buddy. But you have that choice. You get to make the decision of what that actually looks like. Now, the next thing is, is we need to make a point in an agreement with ourselves. What does it look like when we're ready to ascend? When do we start to ascend? Now, typically, we want to make sure that no matter what happens, just like open water, we want to make sure that we're popping the surface with at least 500 PSI or 50 bar, whichever you're into, minimum. So if we're going to get to the surface with 50 bar, we need to plan a little bit ahead of time, if, if, like in our car. If we, if we want to make sure we always fill our gas tank when it, uh, at a quarter tank, we've got to plan before we get to the quarter tank, right? Fair enough? Give me the okay if you, you agree. Okay, Josh. Perfect. Okay, so you got to make a little planning here. So as you get deeper, it takes longer to ascend. Your safety stops might be longer. So typically, what I'd like you guys to start thinking about as we get into this deep diving is considering a little bit earlier ascent. But typically, as we start getting into this, we start talking about the rule, rule of thirds. Josh, can you explain the rule of thirds to me? Uh, uh, third there, third back, third reserve. Absolutely. So if I've got 3,000 PSI, what does that look like? If you got 3,000, that means you can spend 1,000 going somewhere, 1,000 coming back, and then 1,000 for anything that might happen. Absolutely. David, which direction in a current should I start my dive? With the current or against the current? Start against it. Why? Because when you're tired, you can always stop swimming and drift back to where you started. Absolutely. That's absolutely one reason. What's another reason I would start against the current, James? What's one reason why you'd start against the current? Yes. Why would I want to start against the current? You're going to spend more exertion going down, pushing against the current. So you're absolutely. going to have a higher level of reserve come back. Absolutely. So if I start with the current and then I have to come back and I'm using that 1,000 out, 1,000 back, I'm probably not going to have a thousand back. So I'd like you to guys to start considering using the rule of thirds on your deep dives. Um, it's going to add an additional level of safety so that when you guys uh, see that magic thousand PSI mark, it's time for you guys to start beat feet and head into the surface. Okay. You need to be on the surface with uh, more than a thousand PSI. So you got to make this plan, right? I'm, I'm heading back. It's time to start heading up. So, Start thinking about that as I want to have a little bit more reserve. What happens if, let's see, none of you have done my river dive yet. Uh, J David, you're just about ready to go hit the river with me. Um, but what happens if, what happens if you get down there and you blow into, into, re uh, into deco and all of a sudden you find yourself at a 10 minute deco stop? Grab a rock and hold on. Grab a rock and hold on. But what about gas? Oh, I see. Yeah, Would you set right. up a stage bottle or have a secondary on you? But what if you haven't done that? You've just gone down single tank. You've you've uh, blown through. If you have, if you use the rule of thirds, where your goal is to be at the surface with more than a thousand psi, how long can you last at that 25, 20 foot safety stop with a thousand psi of gas in your tank in reserve? Pretty good amount. Twenty five feet, probably about twenty minutes or so. Yeah, probably closer to thirty, but. Um, I pick up what you're putting down. So 1,000 PSI um, gives you quite a bit of time, right? So allow yourself the extra safety stop. Give yourself that time to think about things. Um, and as we do this, I want you guys to start thinking a little bit more about your safety stop. What does that look like, right? As we start coming up to that point, our, what is our safety stop going to be, okay? So... As we go through this process, we've talked about this, in the, in, and you guys have all been through this with me at least once. 
The M value is the maximum amount of nitrogen on an ascent that a cell can hold before it turns into symptomatic bubbles. Okay, that's your technical dive terms for the day. What that means to you is that when a cell has collected too much nitrogen and it's being exhausted too quickly, it comes out in the form of bubbles. These bubbles start as bubble seeds. They move their way up to silent bubbles. And then from silent bubbles, they become symptomatic. Now, the challenge with this, guys, is that this is a fuzzy logic area where they change from bubble seeds to they grow at enough tension to become silent bubbles to eventually symptomatic bubbles is going to be different for everybody. James, how you your body off gases nitrogen is going to be different than Josh, is going to be different than Dave, it's going to be different than Nikki, and it's going to be different than me. So there's a, a gray area of what this actually looks like. And there's a safety margin. Now, the good news is the dive tables are built with a basic safety margin in them. But what we can basically add to this is we can say, as we do less deco, less safety stops, we reduce that safety margin. As we take the time to do more deco, longer safety stops, we reduce that risk by reducing the size of the bubble and allowing them to come out much more slowly. What I'd like you to do to take away from this is a dive tables and safety stops are how divers manage the size of the bubbles in their bloodstream. Safety stops assist in the reduction of the size of those bubbles. Now, there is no clear line between good and bad in this. And every diver is different in the way their body manages bubbles and size reduction. Moral story, do a safety stop, please. Now, interestingly enough, ITI um, did a study, and I think I've shown this all to you one, before, but let's talk about it just one more time. They determined um, if they took a group of divers to 25 feet, or, or I'm sorry, uh, 120 feet for 25 minutes on a non-decompression dive, okay? And then they had them do a direct ascent to the surface. From 120 feet on a 25-minute dive, they did a direct ascent. This is the blue group. What they determined is at about the 17-minute mark, the average Doppler radar count of bubbles was about 116, 117,000 bubbles per cubic liter, okay? Now, they took a, a different group of divers, and they had them stop at 10 feet for two minutes. And what they determined is that at about the 15 minute mark, they were right at 20,000 bubbles per cubic liter. Now they took a third group and I'm going to change the colors on this, by the way. They took a third group and they had them do a safety stop for one minute at 20 feet and four minutes at 10 feet. The interesting thing is as look at where their residual nitrogen bubble count is at the 43 minute, 42 minute mark. Is that pretty impressive, guys? All of a sudden, their bubble count of the residual nitrogen is zero. So, key takeaways from this. A safety stop reduces bubbles. A longer safety stop reduces more bubbles than a shorter one. And a five-minute safety stop during a repetitive dive increases dive safety. Do a safety stop. Now, as we do go through this process... I also want you guys to think about one additional thing. Josh, if I come up from a dive and I'm sitting on the surface with my head out of the, out of the water, am I still decompressing? Yes. Yes. Am I decompressing more than if I was standing on the surface? Yes. Absolutely. I've got pressure on me, right? David, what do you think happens to the bubbles of nitrogen in my system as I lug a 117 cubic foot tank out of the freaking water up the stairs? Uh, they increase in size and come out faster. Absolutely. <laughs> so as you guys are carrying this heavy ass gear, and James, you've got to have noticed by this point, scuba gear ain't light. I, I don't know about you, but I think I got one of the reasons I got out of the Marine Corps is I didn't want to carry a freaking pack on my back anymore. And now I've gotten into sport with a a bunch of crap that's twice as heavy as what I was carrying in the core. What the hell? I thought I was away from that crap, but apparently not. So now we get to carry our heavy ass tanks up a hill. So one of the things I want to talk to you guys about is there's something called body decompression. 
Now, one of the things I see divers do, and it's a big mistake, is they go out and they do their deep dive. They hit the, the stairs and they want to climb out of that water as quickly as humanly possible and hike up that god dang hill for whatever reason as fast as possible. I don't know why they do that, but I see it all the time. What I'd like you guys to consider doing is when you guys end your dive, hang out in the water for a little bit. Talk to each other. Keep your head on the water. Let your body rest in the water column and stay in for five or ten minutes extra. What it's going to do for you is called body decompression. And in this process of body decompression, it's going to allow the bubbles to come out of your fast and slow tissue slowly and evenly. But they're going to come out slowly because your body is still under light pressure. And you have an added tension and effort to your body to create a faster heart rate and, and force that bubbles out faster. Your body, be, this is your way because we're, uh, well, everybody but Josh, the rest of us are a little older. We have to worry about this more, but be gentle on yourself. You've only got one body. Take it easy. Spend a little bit of extra time in the water. It's called a body decompression. It's definitely something I encourage. All right. So one of the things, that, um, some of the things that we need to worry about in deep diving are things like regulator icing, external icing, internal icing. These are definitely things that happen. David, you had a, a regular ice up. I did. How cold was it when it iced up? Not terribly. Um, I'd have to check to be sure, but I think it was around 30, 38 or 42 degrees. Yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. we're diving in a little bit colder environment. It's not freezing. But we have to realize as air comes out of pressure and reduces pressure at a speed, it comes out colder. As it reduces pressure, it, it chills. As it pressurizes, it gets hot, right? So it's a reverse effect. So one of the things that we saw last year, my wife and I were diving 33 degree water and we were really excited. Um, we found a, a new spire and we decided to send up an SMB. So we're at the bottom. She, just like we'd always done, she reached over, grabbed her regulator, pulled out her safety second, stuck it on the bottom, went ahead and pressured uh, pressured, filled that thing up, sent it to the surface on a reel, tied it off real quick, and then looked over, and her regulator was free flowing. She whacked it, didn't work. Took a regular regulator out, tried to breathe on it, didn't work. Turned it down, whacked it again, didn't work. Full free flow. <clears throat> Just in that 30 seconds of filling up, not even that, probably 20 seconds of filling up an SMB, it was able to come out cold enough that it froze the regulator open. It is absolutely something that will happen and can happen. It is one of the reasons that when we fill our SMBs, I would prefer that you guys do not use a regulator to fill up your SMB or an LP hose. So when we get out there, I'm going to teach you guys a new way to fill up your SMBs, but I'll give you the preview. I think David and I think Josh, I think you've both seen. Ben, you froze. Yeah, I think we lost him. I was gonna say, I th I'm glad it's not just me. Well, David, are you going to continue teaching the class? <laughs> uh, I am not entirely authorized for this class, so. I mean, I'd... we can tell you how he fills the SMB, if you would like, while he's gone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can tell you the rest of that story. The regulator froze with the, the thing, and so now... The, the most efficient way that he's found to fill an SMB is with the exhaust port of your second stage because you're already breathing that air. So you've got no wasted air and you've got no, um, no additional risk of your regulator freezing because you're already breathing that. And so you're not adding to the risk by using it excessively. And, uh, so it's just a little bit more efficient all around. Now it's just a waiting game. See how long it takes for him to get back.
Sorry about that, guys. We're just. Hey, we got you back. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, we're just with your nets. Weird. All right. So what I'm going to teach you guys with the SMB is to roll your SMB out, crack the bottom of it open, um, and hold it up and turn your head to the side. You're already exhaling gas. Why not use the gas that you're already exhaling to fill your SMB? Simply turn your head to the side, open the, the slit at the bottom, and breathe normally. It'll exhale right right into the SMB and fill that up nice and tight. Once you've got a standing column and water column, check your reel uh, or your spool to make sure everything is the way you want it to be, and then give it two more exhales and let it let it fly. One of the skills we will be doing at deep water is you will all have the you will, I should say all you both will have the opportunity to launch an SMB. So please make sure you have an SMB in a spool. It is a required item. Um, and it's something you should be carrying with you anyway. Um, I carry two. Um, but then again, David, what's my rule of thumb with gear? Your rule of thumb with gear? One is none, two is one. Oh. Exactly. So I'm like, uh, I, it's very rare for you guys not to catch me with two items on me of the same thing. So be aware that that is definitely something that happens. Um, as we're diving deep, be aware as well that uh, fatigue can set in. We're diving deeper. One of the things that most people don't realize is as you dive deeper, your heart and your breathe, work of breathing will increase. The air density gets higher. Now, one of the things that people don't realize is as that density of gas gets higher, your lungs, your heart, your blood system, everything has to work harder. It's one of the most common reasons that inexperienced dive shops kill guests on their trips. Believe me or not, 58% of all dive accidents are cardiac related. Not long ago, I was reading through the accident report on a, on a dive shop that took a, a diver, a, an elder, older woman who was an office worker on a dive trip. They decided to see if they could do six a days on a dive. She hadn't been diving in over a year, so they did a quick, quick update on her. They did a navigation class and a, a nitrox class on her in two days and then took her on a, di a trip to Roatan. Six days, and they were doing. They were also doing reverse profiles. And on day four, when they took her out and did a reverse profile, they were surprised when she had a heart attack. A 60-foot dive for 45 to 60 minutes is equal to about a four to five minute brisk. Four, I'm sorry, four to five mile brisk walk. Okay, so be aware. Absolutely, as we're getting into the stuff that. Um, that what we're doing is we're putting additional cardiac stress on ourselves. Be kind to yourselves. If you get together with a shop and they want to do four days and five days, tell them to saw it off. If you're not in the shape for it, you're asking for a problem. You are dealing with a shop that is, is inexperienced with the human physiology and is going to kill somebody again. It happens. It's pretty common. 58% of all dive-related accidents are cardiac-related because of the additional work of breathing presented by diving. So please don't be a statistic. Um, you will absolutely get tired. Um, one of the, I've, I've heard this so many times from so many different divers. If you want to lose weight, you get into uh, big-time decompression diving because the work of breathing and everything that you're going through, you burn weight. Now, I can tell you after doing uh, four days of deco diving, um, that I usually, even with my meal plan of, uh, and my daughter says my diet looks something akin to an unsupervised fourth grader at a birthday party. Um, so, but I can tell you that even with that, I still end up losing a little bit of weight uh, for the effort and the exercise. So just be aware, it's, it's a real thing. Diet plan accordingly. You don't have to see the whole freaking ocean in one dive trip. It will be there next dive trip. So be kind to yourselves. Uh, hypothermia, we've all got a pretty good understanding of that, but beware, even in 82 degree water over the course of uh, five days, hypothermia has a cumulative effect. Day one, you'll get out and you'll be like, I just want to dive in shorts and a t-shirt. 
day five, you'll feel start feeling it's a little cold. Start with day one wearing a uh, actual wetsuit. Protect yourself. Be safe. Don't be that idiot diving in uh, board shorts and, and bare chested. You don't look cool. I promise you. You look kind of stupid, to be honest with you. And you look like you don't know what you're doing. So I see it all the time. I, I do. I've, I've seen it off plenty of dive boats. And I'm like, obviously, you don't have a good understanding of physiology. So don't be that guy. Be safe. Be aware that you can get hypothermia in a, in a hundred degree or a 80 degree, uh, 100 degree desert going into a tent where it's cold, a lot, really cold. What happens with hypothermia is it's a reduced uh, core body temperature. It can happen. You can get hypothermia in 82 degree water. Absolutely. So be aware. Now, one of the common things that happens as you start going uh, deep is we start getting into something called hypercapnia, uh, a, a carbon dioxide buildup. It happened to me. I'll be the first to admit it. My first time deep diving, um, I was short breathing and I didn't realize it. So what ended up happening is I started feeling a little bit of panic and anxiety. And that's unusual for me. A little bit of fear was kind of creeping in. I, I'm not that guy that gets scared, right? I'm, I, I just don't. So what I do and what we teach you in open water is the exact same thing. Stop. Breathe. Think. And then whatever action you're going to do next, make sure it's the right action that will take you to closer to safety. Now, if there's nothing to do, there's nothing to do. My first time getting having this happen, I was 110 feet, pitch black with the worst dive light that, on the face of the planet. It was a double A dive light, um, but it's the only one that Brett could lend me. And I was feeling anxious. It was pitch black. I stopped, breathed, three deep breaths. And I thought, and the first thing I looked at was, am I okay? Do I have enough gas? Yes, got a ton of gas. Gas means what, uh, David? Gas means time. Gas means time. More gas, more time. Just that easy. Okay, got plenty of gas. Am I entangled in something? No. Can I get it back to the surface? Yes. Is there a sea monster going to eat me? No, I'm in Ryrie. God, what, what am I thinking, right? Everything's going to be okay. Once you get past those fears, stop, think, breathe, then act. Make that decision. It's to your advantage. It definitely has um, advantages to be go through that process. Let's see. You guys are all pretty fresh out of open water, so I don't know that I need to go through my narc video with you again. I think you've probably all seen it enough times. Uh, we've talked about dive computers. Um, dive computers is kind of interesting in that did you guys realize that the first dive computers were designed for the Navy and they were top secret? Um, it, what they determined was in the late 60s, the uh, Navy came to the Scripps Institute. They needed something to be able to monitor the amount of time their divers were down. And they said, we need to create a computer to monitor their nitrogen so they can stay down longer um, but be safer. So they created the first dive computers. And they, were, they were considered top secret. Um, what we do with them now is... Dive computers have one primary goal. It's past monitoring depth. What is the primary real goal of the dive computer, Josh? To keep you safe. Keep you safe. What is it monitoring, though? What's its primary job? What is it monitoring? Um, the time you spend at depth. Close. Go a little deeper for me. It's monitoring the amount of nitrogen in your system. Mm. That's its whole job. In moderate, now, the cool thing is we've added some cool features to them, like a centimeters, time, um, tank. Uh, they'll, we can now have it monitor the amount of gas in our tank, but a dive computer's primary job is to man manage and monitor the amount of nitrogen. That's its primary goal. Its secondary goal is to man manage your oxygen toxicity level. Those are its primary goals. Your safety, but... It's monitoring your nitrogen and your oxygen, number one and number two goal. So it's kind of interesting to understand that. Now, like, a nice thing is, is with these dive computers, they'll they'll definitely help you keep uh, keep within the no decompression limit. Their intended use, though, is to monitor your nitrogen and oxygen. Um, their limitations. Maybe what's the limitation of the dive computer? Uh, 
battery life and uh, the, the programming. Yeah, good job. You did pay attention. The algorithm. So here's the thing. Uh, we are going to, I can't say this enough. I, I don't like doing this, but this is a standard. I have to follow the standard. We will be diving a reverse profile. Please, please, please do not um, dive a reverse profile unless you are with me on a spe specifically profile is what you'll find. Hmm. Well, let me share my screen anymore. Okay. Share screen. I'm going to try that one more time. Window. There we go. So we want to make sure we're diving a multi-level uh, level diving, but we're doing our deepest dive first to our shallowest dive. The problem with doing a reverse profile is that the algorithm is not designed to be able to monitor the uptake of gas into the slow tissue in a reverse profile. It's not ever able to accurately measure that. It's just not designed. So when you do a reverse profile, you're working against the computer algorithm in a reverse way that it doesn't know how to compensate for. So if you could, please, please, please always do your deepest dive first, followed by your deep, your shallower dive and then your shallowest dive. Um, that's the, one of the biggest limitations is the algorithm itself. So what happens if we go out, guys, your dive computer fails you and you have to do a scent, but you know that you stayed past your safety, uh, the non-decompression limit. Go with the most conservative factor and take a deep stop. Exactly. All the most conservative factor, but there we go. It's right on the dive tables for you. If you go to that SSI app again and use that, should the diver exceed the NDL time limits by less than five minutes, it's recommended that you ascend normally to 15 feet and, and um, stop for at least 10 minutes or longer if your gas supply allows. Should you exceed the Doppler or Doppler compression limit times by more than five minutes, but less than 10 minutes on any dive, it's recommended that you stop at 15 feet for at least 20 minutes or longer if your air supply allows and refrain from any further diving activities for at least 24 hours. So if you blow that safety, uh, that uh, deco time, make sure you're taking the time to do a full decompression stop and take that time as much as the gas will allow. Is it gonna hurt you to do an extra long safety stop? Yeah, that's all that time wasted. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, wasted my time, dang it. So, now, you guys want to talk about our dives and what we're going to do? Let's do it. That sound like a good plan? Yep. Yeah. All right. So, when we get out to our dive site, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through and do what, Josh? We're going to get to the dive site. We're going to do what? Uh, dive briefing. Absolutely. So, the dive one is going to be 60 feet. We're going to do it for 20 minutes. And we're going to go through a few skills. What skills do you think we're going to go through, David? Uh, mask one through three and the regular drills, just deep. Uh, the nice thing is we're going to do our first dive at 60 feet, and I am not going to make you guys do mask or regular drills. I, I'm hoping at this point that you guys pretty much have your regular drills down and your, uh, and your mask drills that you can take those off. What other drills do you think we might want to do, though? SMB. SMB, absolutely. So, oh, I haven't actually read the course for this one, so I, or at least not do? since I did it last year. But fair enough. All so, right. Let me just kick over to the pro mode on this. There we go. So we're going to go through and do some skills. SMB is going to be the main one. Um, I'm also going to have you guys do a regular drill where you have to find your secondary. There's a chance you might have to do an air share, a stationary air share as well. 
this is I was trying to pull up my, my cheat sheet on this, but it's being weird. Let's see. Give me one moment. I'm going to pull up my cheat sheet on all the skills that we will. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. On this, for some reason, it's being weird and it's dark in my office and I don't have my slate with me. So let me grab my slate real quick and let's go through it. But we're, our first dive is going to be 60 feet for 20 minutes. Why, is, why do you think we start with a 60 foot dive instead of our 100 foot dive? You can acclimatize to it and see if there's any issues that you have. Exactly. It's more for me than for you. I want to make sure that um, I'm able to find and make sure that you guys are able to handle basic diving. Um, if there's any issues, I'm more apt to be able to handle a, a simple situation at 60 feet than it would be at 100 feet. So I guess it's more for you. It's, it's, it's a safety procedure. I want to make sure that we're going through and able to handle the basics of going down to 18 to 24 meters, 60 to 100 to 80 feet. Uh, for a period a period of time. Our in-water checks, we're going to make sure we're going to start with a buoyancy check of the total dive system. We're going to do our knife control descent. Um, we're going to uh, make sure our equipment's adjusted good, and I want to see a good hover. Have I talked about hovering enough to, to give you an idea that it might be important? Josh, how, how important do you think I, I feel hovering is in this course? Um, I mean, yeah, it's very, it's very important. Absolutely. It's, I, I think it's probably the number one skill. Um, we're going to deploy an SMB. Um, the good news is, is I'm not going to go too crazy on you on dive one, but I will task you up. I will do, um, something. It'll most likely be an air share, a stationary air share, but I will ask you to cut the drill. Um, from that point, we'll do, we're going to do a controlled ascent and I need you guys to stay together as buddies. Josh, you and James are now best friends. Say hi and give each other a big high five and a hug if you like, because now you guys are best friends. Oh, I like it, James. Good job. <laughs> I do that all the time, so I, I dig it, man. Um, so you guys are going to be descend as a, as, a, as a couple. You're going to hover as a couple. You're going to work as a team. Now, I'm going to give you kind of a preview. At no point in any diving that you will do with me are we not a team. I always remember... The, you guys remember the first big uh, swim scene in the guardian where he was uh, the, the, the one guy, um, nobody helped him and they kicked him out and threw him away. He's like, you didn't tell me it was a team sport. He says, when is it not? When we're diving together, it's always a team sport. Now I will certainly preface things with, I am just there to be a guide and, and directly supervise, or I may preface it. If I'm just there to be a guarding angel and a, uh, um, a gremlin, but if there's an actual emergency, I promise you, I am right there for you. That is what we're going to do. We're going to go through it, and then we're going to come up. We're going to do a safety stop, and then we're going to do a basic SAC review to see where we're at on everything. At the end of that, we're going to um, go through, and we're going to do a, a dive briefing at the end of this to figure out what happened, what what it looked like, what's going on, and what, what I expect. Easy enough? Dive 2 is going to be very much the same. Um, we're going to – somebody. The good news is, James and Josh, I'm not going to make you guys both launch an SMB at the same time. So on dive one, I will pick uh, one of you randomly. I will probably do a uh, sip, shot, boom, um, and to decide one of you to do an SMB, and, uh, and the other one doesn't have to. Dive two, the other one will get the chance to do an SMB as well. Make sense? Let's see. As we go through this process... Um, and we go out to the 60 foot mark. Um, good news is, guys, on a slate, I have a group of questions for you. Um, they are math questions. They're all like 1.8, 2 plus 7, 3 plus 6, uh, 6 plus 9. Um, and I will have you guys do those and I will time you at each depth on these. Make sense? At the 60 foot or at the 80 foot mark, I'm also going to set up a line, and I'm going to have you guys have me help me set this up. And what we'll do is I'll put a stake in the ground. Uh, we're going to swim out about 100 feet. I'm going to ha I have a mark on my line, and we're going to and we're going to uh, tie it to something. And what we're going to do is we're going to gently swim back, and I want you guys to count your fin strokes so you guys know how far 100 feet is. It's kind of misleading. You guys have dove enough at this point. Could you honestly tell me if I told you swim? Only 100 feet, you could do it. 
I could make a decent guess, but I don't know. Exactly. Well, we're going to take that guesswork out of it for you. So we're going to go through, and I'm going to have you guys swim 100 feet at a normal pace and count your kicks. We're going to turn around, and we're going to go back the other way, and I'm going to have you guys look at your timing device, and I'm going to have you go both ways and time it, a hundred, just 100 feet. And I want you to time yourself going from one in the line to the other line, turning back and coming back to the original point. Do you guys, could you guys honestly tell me how long it's going to take you to swim 200 feet underwater at a normal pace? Oh, normal's hard. Yep. So I want you guys to get an idea. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, through this process, we're going to definitely be doing um, hand and arm signals. Um, and I want you guys to make sure that you're doing some basic navigation. I want you guys to be able to tell me at the end of dive two, what direction compass wise was the, was the line facing? I would, I would like both the going and coming. Now, James, here's one of your questions. I'll cut down the questions. If my azimuth course going straight out is one direction, what do we call the return course? The 180 degree course. Second, the azimuth is Black out. Azimuth. The back azimuth, but there's another term we're looking for. It begins with an R. The reciprocal, reciprocal of it, the opposite, the 180. <laughs> That's exactly what I was looking for. So we're going to be looking. I want. I need you guys to note down. Um, here's the interesting thing. Who believes that you guys will all have the exact same number? And it's going to vary between a degree or two. Sometimes more. I, I usually see it uh, vary about 15 degrees. It's pretty funny. Um, it Where it doesn't vary that much um, is when we're all using um, magnetic um, um, old school actual bubble compasses. If we're all using digital compasses, I usually see about 10, 15 degrees difference between them. It's pretty funny. So that will be dive two. Dive three is the uh, most fun, in my opinion. I've got some special surprises in store for you. Um, I will bring some uh, props with me for fun. Um, we will launch an SMB at 100 feet. We'll do our math again and time it. Um, and we'll do some additional skills. But I've got some fun surprises for you guys at 100 feet. And then we'll come back up. Each dive will be about 20 minutes. That's what I'm expecting. Um, I would encourage each of you to bring three tanks. That way we know that as we go out, we've got plenty of gas. Honestly, you probably can get away with one tank for dive one and two, um, but why risk it? Um, air is cheap. It comes with the course, so just grab three tanks. There's only two of you. So why not Why not have the extra gas on you? Easy enough? Yep. So look forward to my fun and games. Um, as well. So the next thing we just need to figure out is when can we go diving as a team? We need three dives to certify you. I'm pulling out my calendar now. I know. James, you're going out of town this coming week, if I remember correctly. Oh, I've got very limited availability. So I'll be heading out of town uh, Saturday evening. And I won't be back into town until Friday. So I was thinking, let's see, da, da, da. either the afternoon of the 4th or the evening of the 5th. So I'm going to be out of town that whole week. I'm heading up to okay. um, northern Idaho. Gotcha. I will be coming back on the, I think the seventh. For gotcha. that one, I got to check my other calendar. Let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna be a buzzkill on this one because I've got, I'm pretty close for all of July and August. I've got availability on. Uh, the 28th, the 29th, the 30th. Of this month? Yeah, of July. 
me look at that. Um, 28th, 29th, and 30th, I am in uh, Yellowstone. Now, if you guys would like to do your dives in Yellowstone, I would absolutely love to have you guys come out to Yellowstone and dive with me. Um, but right now, we are scheduled to be in Yellowstone. Those would be fantastic dives. They won't be quite as deep, but they'll be more interesting dives. So you guys are welcome to drive up to Yellowstone and dive with me in the lake. We could also do, let's see. Dang it. I am actually leaving out of town on the 31st. I have to go to Boise. So if you guys want to come out to Boise, I would love to dive uh, um, Lucky Peak. I have not dove Lucky Peak yet. Um, I don't think I'll be able to make it out to Boise. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I, I'm, I've actually put, put this trip off for a few weeks, and, and uh, it's... Let's see. Are you just going to dive or are you going to do something? I'm going to work. Um, but I, I was thinking about taking my gear and diving in the evening. Um, I've got enough friends up there that I could get a dive in pretty easily. So after the 7th, I mean, I've got availability from the 7th to the want to dive 11th. On the you guys want to well, dive on the 7th? No, I won't be getting back on the 7th. It'd be the 8th that oh. I'd be getting back. Sorry. No worries. Um, I've if, got available from the 8th to the 11th. Gotcha. Let's do the 8th. Meet out at Ryrie at uh, 5 o'clock. 5 p.m. The 8th of what? August. August. I work for you guys? I cannot make that, but I also don't need to. So, Josh, can you make it? Yep, I can make it. All righty. We'll be diving uh, 5 to 8 p.m. Let's see. I'm putting that. Let's we'll see. More options. Let's see. Josh. Josh Matulo. And James. Put that on my joint calendar. All right. I got it set. Ooh. I was going to say, unless you can do the 9th or the 10th, I'd prefer the 9th or the 10th, but. Um, I'm going to look at this the dive shop schedule for that week and see what I've got. But uh, right now, it's tentatively put for the 8th. But if I can move it to the 9th, I will. I, it seems like there's something on the 9th, but I can't remember what it is. Yeah, I'll hold on to that. I mean, it should, it should be fine. Oh, crap. Hold on. Uh, let me look at my work calendar. I. Just <laughs> I've got both of mine up too, so yeah, oh, man, we're gonna hate that. Yeah, let's see. Uh, I may have just screwed myself on that. Let's see. Um, we'll have to move it for sure to the tenth um, because I will actually be in Sun Valley. Um, from Sunday to the uh, to Wednesday, so let's move it to the tenth. Yeah, the tenth would work for me. Yeah, that's fine. Edit, send. There we go. Does that work for you, Dave? Yep. No, that. Oh, Dave. Send me the invite. I might be able to make it late. Yep, I've got to go to. Sun Valley and meet with a bunch of brats. So, and then I'm can't I'm leaving for Yellowstone on the 11th. So, there we go. Got it. Got it scheduled. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. And then, uh, are you coming to the dive shop tomorrow night, um, uh, James? No, I'm going to be out in uh, Mountain Home for the rest of this week. Okay. Not a worry at all. What I can do? Do you want? Do you want the navigation certification? Um. Yeah, I'll definitely take a look at that. Okay. Um, when you order the course, just let me know if you'll just call tomorrow over to Ash, um, that, and uh, order the cert. Uh, just, just let me know or have her let me know. And what I'll do is I will email you five questions. Um, I will uh, trust in your Army honor that you're not going to cheat or look at the book um, for the five for the answers. And I'll accept them via email as long as you make me the promise that you won't cheat. Okay. Easy enough? Yep. 
Cool. So, and then once I get, uh, once you do that, you'll have to just do the homework. Um, and uh, cause I can't pass it off without the homework, but the homework's easy. I, I, I actually ended up doing uh, the homework on a couple of the classes like this, this morning. And uh, I did two classes in about five minutes. So if you know the material, this stuff's easy. Oh yeah. And a lot of it's just repeats of it. Exactly. So it is what it is. So cool. All right. Anything else you need for me? Nope. I'm good. Nope. All right. What questions do you have? Josh, what did you learn tonight that you didn't expect or that what did you learn tonight that was different? That I didn't expect or was different. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, more more dive planning. Um, I don't think the the course materials really cover a ton into dive planning. So, cool. Right on, James. What'd you pick up tonight? Um, that the math gets progressively harder as you start working with multiple tanks and uh, getting on more technical dives. Taking a look at those spreadsheets that you're working on was definitely a little bit eye opening for it. That's probably the. The toughest part of uh, technical diving is the math. Um, the most important part uh, in my planet is the math and the hover. If you can do those two things, you can absolutely tech dive. So <coughs> did you pick anything new up today? Uh, I'll have to play around with it, but... Wilson? Can you hear me? Did you yeah, pick anything new up today? Uh... I might have. I'm going to go play with the... I think your mic is working, bud. No, I can we hear can him. hear him fine. Can you hear me now? Hear me? Can you say something? Now? There we go. All yeah. right. All right. That was weird. Yeah, it was. Um, I might have. I, I'm going to go play with the Imperial numbers and see why those don't work as well as the metric numbers. So please do. Absolutely. There you go. Well cool. Well, I'm glad you guys learned something. Well again, uh, we went through a lot of stuff. We talked about a lot of dive planning. We talked about a lot of different things. Um, again, I will have this online um, probably tomorrow. Um, and you are welcome to go through it at your leisure. There's uh, quite a few different courses online. Um, that I've produced. Um, I have deco planning on there. I've got uh, XR online. You guys are welcome to go through those at any time. And, and what you'll find is that definitely the courses get deeper and more complex as you go along. And when he starts coming to the math and dive planning. <laughs> so easy enough. Looking forward to dive with you guys. Thank you. All right. Cool. Go get them, Tigers. We'll see you.